Good afternoon. We'll open or convene the Siskiyou County Board of Supervisors at a joint meeting with the Klamath County Board of Commissioners. Would you all please stand and have a mic stand? Since we met uh, on December 30th, that uh, task force had a final meeting and uh, announced an agreement in principle on certain upper basin issues relating to water use uh, and then land use issues, basically. And it promised that they were going to put together a final agreement, uh, which uh, was ultimately unveiled in March and uh, brought forth in a signing ceremony last month where this upper basin comprehensive agreement uh, was, was rolled out and has now been sent to Washington, D.C. And as we understand, it's Senator Wyden who's working on a new bill that would uh, authorize the plan of hydroelectric settlement agreement, the plan of basin restoration agreement, and also now this new of basin comprehensive agreement. And so, uh, in the agenda packet that's been distributed, there is a five page summary of that upper basin agreement. I think most folks are familiar with the provisions of it. Uh, essentially, the tribes uh, in the upper basin, particularly the Klamath tribes, have um, offered up some of their water rights at certain times of the year in exchange for commitments uh, for land management. And uh, one of the things that uh, this joint meeting had looked at uh, at our last meeting, which I've talked about separately since, was the question of what would come out of the uh, and whether that would be a proposal that Klamath and Siskiyou counties would be able to support or whether it would not be a productive proposal and that we would continue looking at other alternatives. Um, one of the unfortunate things with this new observation agreement is that it has been explicitly tied to the KBRA and the KHSA, meaning that either they all move forward together or they don't move forward at all. And so, with that, if anyone has any questions, I'd like to get further clarification on some of the things that have gone on. But essentially, we are in no different place than we were the last time we met as a result of this other basic agreement. Uh, 
we're back to still looking at alternatives to the KHS and KBRA and looking for a productive way to move forward given the prospects in Congress for the proposals. And can you uh, express a little bit about, is there, uh, is there any urgency with regard to Senator Wyden and the legislation that he's uh, providing this May? I mean, we've heard that he was going to introduce legislation since last June, and now, uh, I guess, is it different? I have not heard anything different. You know, the, the folks on the Oregon side may have something to report. Uh, according to the press, Senator Wyden does intend to introduce a bill in May. Uh, most of the deadlines we've seen throughout this process over the years have come and gone in some of the ways, so whether they meet that timetable could change to be seen. Uh, I have seen such reports indicating that Senator Wyden would like to try to move something through the Senate by the end of the year. And of course, that still leads to the meeting deal with the House of Representatives, which is another issue entirely. Okay. Questions? Any further comments? Well, I'd like to make a comment. Uh, you're, you're correct. Uh, the timelines that they've set so far in the KBRA dam removal or this new agreement, they haven't met any of the timelines so far to date. Uh, but Senator Wyden has been very, very vocal. He wants to introduce legislation the first part of this month. Uh, who knows if that's going to happen or not. Uh, I think uh, myself, personally, I can't speak for the other board, uh, board commissioners, but uh, I've been very, very quiet since our last meeting, and I haven't uh, criticized them for their efforts. Uh, I've set, set by and, uh, because I wanted everyone to make their own decisions the individual irrigators in, in, the, in the upper basin, specifically on this, this task force. And uh, I think uh, uh, a lot of them have made their decisions, uh, but they've only been able to sign uh, an intent to sign, I guess it would be a term to use on that. Uh, there is no binding authority on any of that, and they're selling it as that. But my guess is Senator Wyden is taking that, those signatures back to Washington, D.C. As, as a proof in quotes, that there's widespread support for it. Uh, granted, I think a majority of the irrigators in the upper basin have signed on to the intent to execute it. Uh, I've talked to a number of them. I haven't gone out and solicited anybody, but I've had many of them come to me and talk to me about it. And uh, that there is a fairly sizable number that aren't going to sign it, period. And they characterize it as uh, uh, the Klamath tribe has made concessions on their water. They have made some concessions, but they actually took the, the common, generally speaking, coming out of those meetings is that the, 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 in the water situation, they will be, the irrigators will have some irrigation water uh, in some years, and at least some of the irrigators will have some water in some years. And that's not a very good uh, agreement. Uh, it's, uh, I'm not saying it's a total surrender, but it's not very next to it, I would say. I've got very good friends that have been working on that for the whole time. Uh, they did the best they could, I feel, with what they had to work with. But uh, it, it, ultimately, the individuals have to make their own mind up. It's being portrayed as making a good business decision. Uh, I look at it as more than a business decision. I think this is a moral issue that needs to be uh, looked at in that respect also. I think it's a combination of a business decision and a moral decision. Uh, are you willing to give up your rights? Are you willing to give up your ability to farm? And as you have in some of these cases for over 100 years, third and fourth and fifth generation farms and ranches. Uh, I think what the state of Oregon has done, believe it or not, I think is, is more egregious than to the Water Resources Department, is more egregious than what the federal government has done. And I thought I'd never, ever say that in my lifetime. Uh, Oregon Water Resources has uh, come after the irrigators with a vengeance. And I don't know how else to put that. Uh, it is plain and simple blackmail against the irrigators, against with our government holding the gun. And uh, that becomes a moral issue then. Uh, it's not just a business decision, it's a moral issue. And I can't uh, in good conscience sign that. And, and again, I, I need to back up, sorry Commissioner Vallejo. Uh, I do have a possible perceived conflict of interest because I am a small irrigator. So I do have a dog in the fight. It's a very small dog. It's a chihuahua, maybe. Uh, but uh, I'm a very small irrigator. And, 
You know, it's not a great day. <laughs> Guarantee it's not a great meeting to <laughs> Until the walk in the morning on changing water, it seems like a great day. Uh, but uh, uh, I think this goes way beyond any kind of a conflict of interest there. It's this, I'm a small irrigator and a big pool of irrigators. And, uh, and, I'm, and I'm elected by the citizens of Klamath County, and I feel uh, the citizens of Klamath County, on, in large, do not agree with this the way it is. This is nothing more than, you might call it a KBRA2, and dam removal is still attached around its neck. And that's something that, that you cannot deny. Uh, if you sign on to it, you don't have to necessarily support it, but you are forbidden to oppose it. Is that American or un American? I really have an issue with that, and, uh, and this is the first time really I've come out uh, in opposition to these agreements for a long time, and I think uh, now is probably the time to do that for myself personally, and, uh, and it's, it's a, a deplorable state that we find ourselves in. Uh, agriculture has been under fire for generations, it seems like, and, uh, and we keep thinking from year to year, when will this ever stop? Well, there are definitely people out there that will only stop when you're gone. And I'm not sure they would stop then either. So I guess I can't be much more harsher than that. Uh, but I think uh, there has to be opposition for this. I think uh, Senator Wyden is going to take it back and put legislation together with dam removal included in it, and probably as it's written right now. Uh, it will probably pass through the Senate. I think it's going to have a, a real uphill battle in the House. And uh, there, I'm going to guess the dam removal may be stripped out of it, maybe not. Uh, but there will be changes made in the House, and no doubt. And uh, if there isn't any opposition, there won't be any changes made. And that's, that's where I'm coming from. I'm not trying to destroy the chances of irrigators to have water. I want there to be opposition out there so when it gets to the House of Representatives in Congress, that there will be an opposition that cannot be denied, just like the KBR was, and then there will be appropriate changes made. That's my, my hope and prayer. I'm not holding my breath uh, because there's lots of uh, high powers there that, that are pulling a lot of strings at the federal level and at the state level. And, uh, and uh, we're, just, we're, we're just the county commissioners for the counties that are being uh, affected by this. Who are we? You know, the, the powers to be at the federal level they apparently know better than we do from the, the citizens that we represent. So that's my take on that. Okay. Anybody else? I think we're moving into three as we get into the upper basin here. Um, I think we should balance this a little bit that way. Supervisor Chris. Just to add on to what uh, Commissioner Vallow said. Um, when we look at our local elected representatives, uh, our congressional representatives, our legislative representatives, uh, none of them have changed their minds on dam removal on the KBRA. Um, just to add that into it, that, uh, you know, they're trying to present this as though the people support it, but over several elections, the people made clear that they don't don't support these agreements. I agree with what uh, Commissioner Mellon said. Thank you, Mr. Morris. Did you want to? Give any backdrop to this upper basin agreement? I think we've covered the basics of the agreement. Okay. If there's anything to discuss, the, the next agenda item was whether the board would want to consider sending a letter of some sort as a comment on the upper basin agreement. Uh, and I have provided uh, in the, the packet, uh, it's the third from the last page, uh, a draft letter for your consideration. Uh, essentially, it, it calls to close attention the fact that this new agreement is tied directly to the other two previous agreements and, uh, and therefore expresses our concern that this once again is not going to be a solution uh, for the upper basin or for the Klamath River. Uh, I think it was Governor Kitzhaber is quoted in the letter as referring to this new upper basin agreement as the last missing piece in the puzzle to fix everything and obviously that is not the case and just to provide a counterpoint to the proponents of the KHSA and KBRA that are out advocating this uh, I think it would be beneficial for the record in some manner uh, to provide the counterpoint that this is not the inevitable solution. And until people come back to the negotiating table, we're not going to get to one. Supervisor Armstrong. Um, I recently read a, a, 
an article that was sent to me by a constituent by Theodora Dowling, um, who's also a constituent, and uh, um, she, though she um, was on the public lands council, um, she published this in the Western Livestock Journal and talked about California's re-examination under the drought that we're experiencing now, some of its past policies, and how they are coming to a realization that the um, removal of dams um, has left them high and dry during the drought with uh, um, very little uh, flexibility in how to manage water, and also that the environmental dedication, uh, permit environmental dedication of the extreme flows is also put a pinch on uh, um, the farming community, and the farming community is raising uh, to a higher level as food prices um, are beginning to soar, and there's an anticipation of, of uh, a potential 30% increase in many of our, our um, food sources uh, because they come from California. And if you've driven through the Central Valley, you see the, um, the regulatory drought um, that is now being followed by a, a real drought. And uh, it's, um, the article talked about, uh, um, had several individuals who talked about this as not being so much about the environment or about specific species as it being about um, wresting control from uh, um, property rights that had been long established and that were now inconvenient and uh, um, needed to have a place for placed in another way, and so um, uh, they had come up with uh, um, many of these policies as leverage in order to wrest control over those property rights and place them into now management. Managers used to be the people who own the water, and uh, the groundwater and the surface water rights, and uh, they were the managers of the water. Uh, if you had an irrigation district, that was the manager of the water uh, corporately for that group. Now the managers tend to be on a regional basis, or they're talking about the federal government. And I see here now we have the WHOOP, which is going to be a joint management entity directed by the Klamath Tribes, a landowner entity, which is, uh, has representatives from the irrigators, and the state and federal representatives. And this seems to follow a pattern. I did a lot of research on the uh, integrated regional water management uh, on the end. On the, yash, on the international level, and it's all about changing control over the use of natural resources and the management of natural resources to this um, more of a, of a government <coughs> control. Uh, and um, it's, it seems to be following this pattern here in the climate basin. And it was very sad to me to see the articles about the uh, livestock being loaded up in the other basin and sent elsewhere. I know that uh, our livestock inventory on the national level has declined in the last 20 years every year except for one. And, uh, uh, you know, we have our farmers and ranchers are in their 50s and 60s. Um, most of them are in their 60s or older. And uh, it's not being, the younger generation is not taking that, uh, um, the reins from that. And it's, it just seems to, to be um, uh, a wrong policy. Speak for um, the property rights of these individuals. I, I think that's a fair assessment. It, it's well stated in terms of this issue isn't so much about um, endangered species, um, although those are the cogs in the wheel. What we're really seeing is a control issue. And um, what's interesting is in this this new upper basin agreement, there's the, uh, the creation, the, the drying up of somewhere near 18,000 acres for a 30,000 acre in-stream uh, increase. In Umatilla County, up at the north end of the state, they are trying to get 30,000 acres out of the Columbia. And as they talk about getting that 30,000 acre feet of water, I, I forgot acre feet on that last comment, they're not really going to get 30,000 acres out of the Columbia. Out of that 30,000 acre feet, in all of their conversations, they talk about uh, economic 
um, enterprise of the agricultural leg of their economy. They talk about the value that brings, the number of jobs it brings, the hundreds of millions of dollars of revenue that get created within the local economy. They talk about food security and economics of the entire policy for using our water wisely and uh, allocating it in the agricultural environment. And what the Klamath River Basin is doing is throwing 30,000 acre feet into the salty Pacific. At the end of the day, this is bad policy. It is, um, it is uh, designed around eliminating private property rights and local control and putting it into a regional hub. The collectivist mind, if you will, if I can call them that, thinks they can do better than the guy with his boots in the ditch. And I disagree with that entirely. I think we need individuals and the freedom for those individuals to make economic decisions without the federal government and the state government, as Tom was describing, uh, jury mandating all the decisions so that you're forced into a solution that isn't equitable. It's not only not equitable based on your water rights, but it's not equitable in terms of uh, what it does to Northern California or Southern Oregon. I've, uh, I've got to agree with that. Um, the, the thing about uh, the Upper Basin Agreement, uh, Commissioner Malums had, had mentioned that we've been fairly quiet as county commissioners let that process go through and see what the irrigators in the tribe and the people concerned about water wanted to um, wanted to um, end up with some type of an agreement that that worked and in their minds and so that process went through we as commissioners um, didn't really say too awful much publicly about uh, what uh, we thought about that. We were pretty quiet about it in regards to uh, not trying to maybe upset the apple cart, see how it worked out. Unfortunately, I think that there was an opportunity there to uh, do better than they did. The thing that I would like to see is if there was an agreement up there, it should not have been tied to the KDRA or to the dam. K-H-A-S-H-A-S-A, whatever. Uh, uh, the, the reason being is I think the KBRA is probably not going to be funded. I think it'll get back in Washington, D.C. and will not happen. That's my personal feeling. Um, so what happens if it doesn't get funded? What's the future? I think that they had an opportunity on the Upper Basin Agreement to uh, stay out of the KBRA and leave the issue of dam removal uh, a, separate, a separate issue. They didn't do that. The people, the reason they didn't, I believe, is because the people involved in it were the same people that pushed the KBRA. I think it would have been better for the state and the feds to stay out of the whole operation and let an agreement between the irrigators and the tribe make some decisions, especially based on what uh, the adjudication process came down through. I think if the feds and the state would have stayed out of it, we would have had a much better agreement. A separate agreement, but that's the way that I wish that it would have been and stay out of the KBRA. I, as you know, with the Climate County Commissioners is sitting on this board, got up the county out of the KBRA because we did not feel that the county had any business being in that agreement, putting county taxpayers at risk and uh, uh, was having to come up with some money somewhere along the way. Maybe we gave up uh, $3 million that the KBRA promised the county, but if it's not funded, we wouldn't get that anyway, and maybe would have had to put the county taxpayer at risk. So I think that that was a wise decision for this board to do that. Um, this board, I'm speaking for myself when I say this board, I, I, but I believe that the uh, uh, Board believes that the dams ought to stay. We've talked about that a lot. And uh, Supervisor Armstrong brought up the fact that, that California is re looking at their dams. 
they're thinking maybe we ought to build more. So I think maybe the drought, in some respects, is a blessing in disguise. It kind of puts things in perspective of why did we build dams in the first place? Without the drought, we could dump maybe more water down the river, everybody would be happy, irrigators would have uh, water, and so would, uh, so would the fish. But, the, but with this drought, it kind of brings to head that why did we build the dams? And maybe California's starting to get on the right page and thinking maybe we ought to keep some dams and maybe build some more. So I, I think that that is a good perspective that, uh, that we need to uh, keep an eye on. I, I don't think uh, Oregon is feeling that way yet, but uh, that we've only got a drought of southern Oregon, basically. It's not very bad up north. So, um, but I think that we need to seriously look at uh, what does the future hold. I believe the future is that the KBRA is not going to get funded as the person could believe. They have, everybody has to sign on to that in December of 2014, again, which we elected not to do. Uh, well, we got ourselves out of our previous board signed on to it. Uh, but then we got the county out of it. So, um, is everybody going to sign on to it next year when it's having funding problems in Washington, D.C.? I don't know. So, I think eventually somebody's got to come up with a better plan. The plan we have right now, um, I've read the, the whole KBRA, and uh, there's an awful lot that I just do not agree with that will never, never work. It's very complicated. And it's uh, pretty open-ended for certain entities that are signers. I believe that uh, it gives an opportunity to uh, be in disagreement and have conflict if you if this actually got funded for 50 years. It's just going to be a disaster. Uh, I think the people that signed it, I think the governors of both states, a previous governor in California, just had no clue what they were signing on. I didn't read it. There were people that just said sign, and the governor's probably signed. Um, they didn't understand, I'm sure. They didn't understand what the future is going to hold. And if you're a signer on that and it goes through, I think you're going to regret it. Um, but anyway, I'll let somebody else talk. Professor Ben. I've, I've been doing a lot of research and um, trying to figure out where we're going in the future. And part of that research and the developments that are happening with the drought, because I agree with you, the drought has opened some ideas and opened some eyes on people that are, are talking about different things. And um, wind and solar power have always been subsidized, and at a certain point, they're not going to be subsidized anymore. And the only thing that's left is hydropower, because people are not going to want to have um, the nuclear power or one of those in their backyard. So it's much better to do the hydropower than it is anything else. And people are realizing that, and they're talking about it more with the implementation of, of some of the new, newer dams that are being talked about. So it's, it's really, really important that we hang on to these dams and keep these as long as possible. And I think that um, in the grand scheme of things, that hydropower will be um, the thing that does keep the dams in and make sure that we're able to produce that. And the companies will decide that there's a a need for that and that they're going to make more money doing that than they are in the wind and the, the solar entities. The habitat restoration that we've done in, in Siskiyou County, we've been working on things since 1986. We have over, well, one RCD, the Scott River RCD has done uh, 15 or 1,200 projects, the Shasta Valley, RCD has done 1,500 projects, and our own road department through the five salmonoid pro program have done, they've replaced about um, 
65 bridges and replace them with culverts so that the salmon have better access. Other way? Yes, replace the culverts with bridges. That's right. I said it wrong. Anyway, so that the salmon have access to the, the mouths of the streams. And below the dams, we have um, 84 creeks and rivers and 471 miles of habitat that have been identified. And um, with the restoration that we've done, I think that's plenty of room for fish to spawn in. The current scheme that is moving forward fairly quickly is that they want more water. And my comment about them wanting more water for the fish and, and things is that the restoration of the habitat hasn't produced more water and it hasn't been able to be measured, then there's something the matter with their, their um, predictions and their monitoring of how much water has been produced and is going back into the river, even with, with the work that has already been done. Because it, see, it's not logical to me to have all this work done and change irrigation um, um, practices and logging practices and all of those things and not have more flows in the river. One thing that we're working on as a board is the, the forest and management, making sure that we get better forest management so that the, after the trees are managed right and we have healthier forests, there will be more water in the, in the, in the um, in the rivers and streams. On our, our um, objectives, one of the things that we talk about is, is um, restoring the impoundments in the higher elevations of the, for the Scott River. And in a recent visit with Randy Moore, the forester, we talked to, um, to him about that. And he seems to be more um, interested in doing that with the drought situation and that's something that has been there before and and it should be able we should be able to do that as a management uh, for that watershed so there's lots of things out there that are coming forward and we just have to be aware of those things and make sure that we um, we talk more about them and push those things that will benefit us the most so that's what i have to say before we continue, I want to take a moment and recognize uh, Oregon Senator um, Doug Whitsitz in the audience. If you want to stand up and just so that everybody knows who you are, I will give you an Thank you for being here. Supervisor Chris. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Through both chairs here, I just want to talk with Commissioner Nellis a little bit on the uh, approbation agreement. I guess we'll we'll talk into that. Um, how much cash is the truck getting through this uh, through this approbation? Well, cash and uh, land land is uh, forty. See, one hundred and forty-seven million. Okay, I think that's yeah. correct. And how many uh, sucker fish will that produce? Mm, up for discussion. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's interesting that they tie in. They go into the uh, the upper irrigators. They got to get 92,000 acres of land, which has nothing to do with sucker fish population. So they hold that over the heads of the irrigators. 40 million in cash, and then 1 million over the next five years. Is that correct for to acclimate them to the 40 million when they finally get it? Yes. Okay. Um, one of the things about the dams as well, you know, that cash going into their pockets doesn't do anything for the sucker fish, and that's. Um, you know, for them to hold it over and say, this is for the ESA, this is for the sucker fish. But if you give us this money and this land, well, the sucker fish doesn't need as much water. I find that awfully interesting and, and uh, uh, wrong, unfortunately. Um, Commissioner Bellet talked about the uh, KBRA, and he's read it, and I think we all have. And one of the trouble things with it is in the KBRA, it sets up the Klamath Basin Coordinating Council which is composed of the super majority of those who opposed uh, the water being turned on in 2001. 
there's a reason why there's a fight every two or three years for Supreme Court justices. They're all arguing to try to, Republicans are trying to stack in their favor, Democrats are trying to stack it in their favor. And with this Cape Climate Basin Coordinating Council, 10 or 12 of those that are on it out of 18 are those who, who support dam removal, those who support the 2001 water shutoff, those who supported the 2010 curtailments and the science for now. Um, and, it, and it does leave a, a blank check for those folks too once they get this power. Uh, section 19.4.5, this is from memory of the KBRA, says that it can be renegotiated if climate change is, quote, reasonably likely to occur. So we set this up with this group with a blank check, and then they can rewrite it once uh, Congress and us are looking at it. Um, I'll talk later about the, the sucker fish here, but I did want to bring up that uh, the oldest uh, short north sucker was found in Copco Lake, 33 years old. And, and they are behind those. Also, the dams uh, Pacific Corps offered, was it last year, two years ago, 20,000 acre feet to be freed from those dams for upper irrigation. Showing there is a tie-in that could be a benefit if the government would be willing to accept their offer. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Okay, uh, so with regard to um, the joint uh, letter to congressmen or congressional representatives, have, is, have we all had a, a moment to review those? It's agenda item number four. It's uh, addressed to uh, Congressman McClintock. I would assume this this will go to all the other uh, affected uh, legislators in the California, Northern California, and Southern Oregon. Is that correct, Mr. Morris? There's no way for the whoever the board would like this to go to. The, uh, lang the language inside of here uh, closes, we're thankful for your steadfast opposition um, <coughs> in maybe that, that sentence, if we're going to include a mailing to all sorts of senators and congressmen from our respective states and in other western states, maybe that language ought to, to be, we encourage your steadfast opposition. Um, in, in, in this case, it's drafted to Tom McClintock. It would be fine sending it to McCarthy or Nunez or Valadeo or those guys, but you would put it on someone else's desk and it wouldn't be worded correctly. Right. You have that, Mr. Morris? Yes, sir. Okay. All right, so our Klamath County Commissioners, are, are you good with this, with that uh, amendment? I mean, we can leave it to, to, to Congressman McClintock the way it is and then. Depending on who it's amended to who it's going to for the more generic. Sure. Okay. Yeah, Is that yeah. it? Actually, in those where we have a record of them being in opposition, I wouldn't mind the opposition okay. correspondence okay. giving them a pat on the back. They've done a good job. I agree with Tom and Jim in their assessment that this this will not make it through the Republican House, especially if you elect the right people. Right. Right. I think we would agree with <laughs> that. So you, you <clears throat> the Klamath uh, commissioners are good with, with the amendments that we've talked about um, on the Siskiyou County side. How are we with this letter? And letters that would go out to other representatives? Two, three, <coughs> okay. Okay. Uh, well, I like, before you go there, I'm, I'm looking at No, so I'm just, you know, it's funny how you, you should bring up a good point. You look at it. I think it's fair to say our senators would probably be on the best, the best, mm -hmm. probably in support of. And you have two senators, that's four out of four that are gentlemen that probably would support something like that. So I think you've got to craft something to show your opposition to it and hope that they would see why our stamp to do Congress is a different ball, right? Supervisor Chris? I don't mean to, uh, our county council could write for Governor Wilson, so I wrote a very good one. I'd just like to add in there, how much of the uh, Klamath Basin is represented by both of these bodies. So I don't think it's just from uh, for the elected bodies for a large geographical area of the Klamath Basin. Um, you may have it in there. I just didn't see it in St. Louis percentage of what we represent. Adds that. Um, also, the, uh, the precedence of the previous elections this will be sent towards other legislators. When we were back in D.C., uh, back Supervisor Cobb's have testified back in June of 2013. 
uh, when we told them that 80% of the county opposed it, uh, they carried weight with the legislators. They, they recognize uh, a large vote like that. And we've looked at the Klamath elections as well with their, with their elections. It's no coincidence everybody they've elected proposes a KBRA. And then uh, that, that, uh, that's just what I'd like to add. Yeah, I would agree with uh, Supervisor Chris there that uh, I think this is very worthwhile to add uh, citizens of both Siskiyou and Klamath County oppose this direction. Uh, uh, all three of us commissioners right here are somewhat uh, a product of anti-KBRA and dam. There was a lot of other issues, all, all, uh, granted, uh, but that was one of the real hot topics there. Uh, and including our state senator race and our uh, House of Representative races. So every every election that we've had over the number of years where this has been in, in play has shown that the citizens of both counties oppose it uh, by a very wide margin. And I think that's something that, uh, as, as uh, Representative Chris said, when they were back in D.C. And, and this last year, and then when I was back in D.C. a couple of years before that, it was the same type of thing. Uh, but what concerns me right now is uh, the scenario that's going on right now, and I'm going to guess in Washington, D.C., is the exact same scenario with the original KBRA and dam removal. Uh, the legislators uh, are going back there with a list of irrigators that are signing on to the intent to sign on and saying, look at all the support we have. And nobody's back there saying, wait a minute, this is not correct. Uh, that's what was the real wake-up call when I went back and when both of you went back uh, and, uh, and, and set this record straight again, uh, our federal legislators, they, they really can't deny that opposition. They absolutely cannot deny that. They try to push it under the table and say, well, look at all these signatures we have here. We've got all these irrigators signing up. But those irrigators, every one of them has got a gun to their head. And, uh, and, and that's almost literal translation, really. Uh, myself as an irrigator and other irrigators in the Upper Basin were basically told the new uh, uh, leverage they have is on regulated well water. They're saying it's all connected to the, to the surface water by what they call a, the best available science of computer modeling, which is a, a farce at best. And uh, they've done this computer modeling that basically says every creek is connected enough to have to shut them off. So, when it comes to signing this new agreement, they will point blank tell you, and they told me this, and they said, if you sign this new agreement, you can pump out of your well. If you do not sign this agreement, you cannot pump out of your well. So I guess if, you, if I sign it, that means there's no interference. Uh, it doesn't work that way. That's not science. That's not even best available science. That's, that's phony science at best. And, uh, and that's what these irrigators are dealing with. And I think uh, our federal legislators need to know that. And unfortunately, I think some of them do know it, but they aren't willing to take a stand and, uh, and call a spade a spade. And uh, that's where we're at right now. And, and that message needs to get back to Washington, D.C. Uh, before this legislation starts picking up any speed, whenever it does come out. So. Well, and along that order, uh, our irrigators uh, in our region, Shasta and the Scott in particular uh, have been watching what happened up, uh, in your region in the Upper Basin and they're concerned that the tables may be turned on them as well. Uh, and I'll, I'll just cite that uh, when Supervisor Chris and I were, were at and, and Commissioner Mallon's uh, back in Washington, D.C. last June, after the hearing, um, I talked to one of Senator Wyden's staff and I indicated why, are, why was California, even Siskiyou County, here? Because basically we read our testimony into the record, and that was it. It all drifted to an, an Oregon di a dialogue. And uh, I was told that uh, we have to take care of Oregon first, and then we'll come to California. So not unlike what's happened up in your region, and now our people are concerned about that as well, um, that could be reality. Classes, and I think that's a, a huge concern for uh, our, our irrigators as well. One of the things that's been released this week as well from the Department of Energy 
is that they've done a study that um, has proven out that there's untapped uh, hydro potential, hydro power potential, and developing many of them could uh, combat uh, climate change. Uh, it's interesting that we, uh, and I think uh, Congressman Lamafa came up with the legislation uh, supporting hydroelectric power. Uh, it's, it's the only answer, really, to uh, what should be cheap, cheaper power rates for its future, but yet, in these agreements, the taxpayer and the ratepayer is going to bear the cost of that, uh, uh, of, of this whole experiment. And uh, I, I, I think that's unreasonable, and I think that they need to come up with a better plan, as we've all discussed. So I'm going to bring it back to the letter. Uh, are we are we good with that, um, gentlemen on this side? I believe we are on this okay. side. And all of us on this side, we're good with that. And, and Mr. Morris would craft uh, necess the necessary changes depending on who it went to. Uh, and would you be able to provide, I guess, from your side, who you would like to see this go to? Sure. Yes. Uh, okay. Does that include the House of uh, well, that's where I'm heading. I think we're all okay with what he provided. I'm, I'm fine with it. Everybody else? Um, and it basically, it was just the vote and... Uh, what was the other one? I'm sorry. Representing most of the water. Yeah. Oh, okay. Because yeah. yeah. I know my district alone is about 100 miles. Right, right, right. I think between Klamath County and Siskiyou County, it's two-thirds of the entire watershed. We could put this on our mobile letterhead, and you put on your letter yeah. and you send it to who you want to send okay. it to and we'll send it to who we want to send it to. You want that, to do it that way? That, that'll work. I think a joint letter. Or, 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 or a joint, joint letter. Yeah. Joint letter. The last, okay. the last meeting we had, we had a joint letter. It actually worked pretty well. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I would, That's I would prefer that we had a joint letter. Well, the joint letter had and somebody sent it out to everybody yes. that we have a list for. Yeah. Okay. Supervisor Armstrong. Yeah. Uh, can we send it to Del Norton and invite him to join us? After we it? Uh, I don't mind that. I, I wouldn't want to hold up this joint letter no, exactly. waiting for them, but yeah. yeah. Who, made up that, who made up that letter? Did you? Plymouth County or yes. Florida? Florida. Florida. We made it up. Okay. So we could make that up. I think that on the agenda we have a little bit of a problem getting our our letterhead on your letterhead. <laughs> so <laughs> we didn't have it. Maybe we can make that up and get that to you, and, uh, so that we can this print it. Yeah, yeah, okay. we'll do it right away. Because as soon as we can get this out, the better. Since we're trying to get ahead of the curve on the inter uh, introduction of the legislation. Okay. Yep. Do we need a vote on this, uh, Mr. Morris? Yes. Okay. So I'll allow. How about the plans, uh, commissioners go on your vote first? That's it. Well, we now have to have never opened our meeting. But sorry. Go ahead. Let's do that. Okay, go ahead and do that. I'll just call this meeting to order. Uh, basically, I've introduced the commissioners already, so we'll just consider this meeting. Okay. Uh, so we will vote on, uh, on sending this letter off. Uh, all in favor, please say what I say. Aye. Chair votes aye. Motion passes. Sir, can I ask you, was there a motion and a second, or just? Uh, oh, I didn't get a second. A second? <laughs> Okay, yeah, we, uh, we uh, skipped the second part. Uh, yeah, there was a motion made. Did you hear it? Uh, yes, to approve the letter, but I didn't get who made the motion. In the okay, I made the motion. Okay. And uh, Commissioner Whitcomb seconded it. Okay. And uh, all in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Chair votes aye. Motion passes. So, okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. And uh, Commissioner Lamont, you can't board supervisors. I'm looking for a motion to approve. So moved. I have a motion by Supervisor Chris. Second. Second by Supervisor Bennett. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. You have that, Wendy? All right. So let's move on to item five. Mr. Morris, do you want to tee this up a bit? Or? Oh, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I'm sorry. One other item that goes back to Stephen Ryan. Uh, something that Clinton County is in a kind of a real odd situation here just because the last Board of Commissioners signed this agreement. And this Board of Commissioners backed out of the agreement. 
but the parties in the agreement, and I've mentioned this to them before, they still somewhat feel like Klamath County is still a participant. We find ourselves in a real awkward position. They're saying we're still a participant, we say we aren't. And uh, somewhere down the road, I'm not sure how we're going to address that. I mean, our county council has been involved in it, and he, and he said, no, we had a, a, a correct uh, uh, motion, and we, we withdrew formally out of it. But they're still saying that. And when you say they, you're referring to the stakeholders in, in the agreements. Yeah, because KBRA and Denver. That's one thing that we thought all along when we refused to sign. Uh, they kept our name on there as though we had actually signed. And I don't. What, what, how did we finally remedy that? Do you well, remember? Not, the, the, the agreements as they stand have a blank signature line for Siskiyou County. And they have a signed signature line for Klamath County. Right. So, in the, and this is problematic because this is pro, this is part of where the, um, uh, I don't want to call it a scam, but uh, I'll let that. Go ahead. Uh, yeah. Yeah, but call a spade a spade. But, but it, it creates a, a perspective that everybody's in agreement, and you have guys dropping off like flies, but it looks like everybody's in agreement in the same way uh, Commissioner Mallins was describing the intent to sign versus an actual uh, signature authority. And, and so it's in their best interest to continue to publicize that kind of County will get $3 million, but I guarantee on the day we go to cash that check, it will not be funded because we're not signatories. I mean, that, that's exactly how it'll play out. They'll keep it like we're in the game, we're in the game, we're being nice to you, come on guys, play along. And then when it comes right down to it, they'll point to the legality of us withdrawing and that will not happen. And so I think it's a real issue that needs to be addressed. Supervisor Armstrong. Yeah, um, if, if it's not a contract, I don't see how they can, buy, you can, a, a prior board can bind a later board. Uh, it's always my, been my understanding you can't do that. Yeah, they, can't bind, they can't bind this board to that type of decision. Yeah. And, and that's the, the, log, the legal logic we use for withdrawal, is we, we knew it was not a contractual relationship. We weren't obligated to perform any services, and, uh, and therefore we, we were very comfortable in withdrawing our approval. Okay. All right, so let's move on to item five. Mercury listings, uh, Mr. Morris. Mr. Chairman, this is a bit of an aside, but it is something that we just wanted to, to note for the record. Uh, one of the other developments since our last joint meeting is that in March of this year, the North Coast Regional Water Quality Control Board put, their, uh, put forth their list of new proposed uh, listings under the Federal Clean Water Act for impaired water bodies. And two of the water bodies that they are proposing to add to the list are Iron Gate Reservoir and Copco Lake as being impaired for mercury. Um, how this relates to, to dam removal is it is just one more reason why this dam removal experiment is not a good idea and another one of the, the many drawbacks to this proposal. As things stand now, to the extent there is mercury in the sediment behind the two dams, uh, it is largely sequestered and breaching those dams would uh, release that sediment and potentially mobilize that mercury and basically wash it out of the river where uh, that movement creates the opportunity for it to become uh, taken up basically in the, in the food chain and uh, get into living organisms. So it is you know, one more reason why this, this is a bad idea and it also deprives us of the potential opportunity in the future to proceed with some of the experiments that they're doing right now in the Central Sierra, that's in the Gold Country, where they're actually going to existing lakes where there are uh, problems with mercury contamination and using modern technology to physically remove the mercury. Uh, once the dams are breached and all this sediment you know, heads down the North river, that opportunity will be lost <coughs> on the planet system. And so we just wanted to point this out and we will continue to, to point to this as one more reason why this dam proposal is a bad idea. Supervisor Armstrong. Now, um, mercury was used in, in gold mining, but we have a lot of natural mercury in the Klamath River. Down by Half Camp, a place called Cinnabar Springs, which is, you know, it's, uh, 
Mercury. So um, one of the issues with uh, our suction dredge miners um, was the flowering of mercury, supposedly, from the action of a uh, five-inch nozzle or a three-inch nozzle and, and disturbing uh, the sediment in the bottom. And now the hypocrisy of this is they will shut down uh, section dredge mining throughout California based um, largely on uh, the latest claims on the flower of mercury. And they will allow it to go down the street by taking dams out and allowing future sediments to move down. It's just hypocrisy. It's it's the same thing. You know, it's good. The uh, experts on this said that uh, you remove those dams in the coho dead for at least two years. And, and for, you know, it's a three-year coho. After three years, it's extinct. You know, it doesn't come back. It's just everyone well, agree that's it. It's not like coho or you know, it comes back in four, year four and five. In fact, it comes back in year two. This cycles back one or two through. So um, you take two of those years out, it's gone. So, um, you know, it's just the hypocrisy of the whole thing. Uh, and it, it's, the science is good when they can use it. It's uh, inconvenient, it's uh, ignored. Hi, uh, Mr. Mount. It's interesting you bring up the, the mercury and the, and the sediment issues, uh, something that we've been very knowledgeable about it. It hasn't been completely hidden, but uh, typical government scenario, uh, if uh, a contractor fails but comes up with the right government want and desire, they will get rehired and rehired and rehired. Uh, on the, on the uh, Rogue River here a number of years ago, they took out Savage Rapids Dam and the Old Ray Dam, and those are very, the Rogue River is very pretty, Clear, crystal clear water, cold water, uh, and the, but they've had nothing but problems since then. Uh, they've had uh, you know, a modeling when they first they were taking, they were talking about taking those dams out that showed the sediment wouldn't be, the gravel wouldn't harm the, the, gra the intakes for the Rogue River Irrigation District, I think it's called. Uh, the, the materials behind the dams, not going to be any problem. Well, since then, the, the intakes for the Irrigation District have been uh, Graveled over numerous times. Uh, they've got chromium six in the water. They've got other uh, other uh, things in the water. Uh, miles and miles of spawning beds are covered up now with six to eight feet of sludge from those. And uh, the company that did the modeling on on those two dam removals and the sediment movement is, as you know, it, the same company that's doing the modeling on the kind of dam sediment movement. Now, does that, that should raise the hackles of every environmentalist in the country, but yet they're signing on to this and wanting us to sign on to that. Uh, I don't see the logic in that. I see hypocrisy again to the highest degree. Uh, if you can imagine the problems they've had in the Rogue River with that very clean water, something that we all recognize here, I think, is letting that 22 million cubic yards or whatever percentage goes down the river with known problems in it, I have zero confidence in the modeling that's out there in the study. I have zero confidence with the track record that the company does. So it's a, it's a, it's, it is a, to call it an experiment is very accurate, I think, but it's an experiment that can't be undone. Once you blow those dams, you can't pull that sediment back, and that's what they found out in the Rogue River. And that was, again, crystal clear cold water, and they had nothing but troubles with it since. What's going to happen with that Klamath water and the sediment from Klamath water? Which, by the way, environmentalists for decades and decades have said that everything in that water is toxic. And that's been built up in the sinks behind those reservoirs, and now it's okay to flush it down the river. What in the world happened in the meantime that I'm missing here? Supervisor Chris. That's a great uh, segue, Commissioner Mellons. Um, in the uh, Kenneth Waters Association uh, newsletter from March 2004 2005, uh, they talk about the benefit of the dams, how the dams act as a settling pond, cleaning up the waters that goes down the river. Uh, 
uh, as you testified there, this is exactly what's happening. The, the dams are cleaning up the water as it goes down the river, acting as a settlement part of that settlement. And that uh, material that, that sells the bottom of those lakes. Um, well, I agree with what the Planet Water Use Association said back in 2005, and right, once those dams come out, then you lose that stellium bond effect, and we have to keep pure water after you lose that effect, which is going to be greater hindrances on the uh, uh, upper basin and climate basin irrigators. Um, and, and you can see what's going to happen in the KBRA, uh, Climate Basin Coordinating Council. I wanted to bring up here a quote that uh, the Krug Tribes Natural Resource Advisor said about the KBRA. Uh, he said, quote, What's capped in this agreement is agricultural water use. Uh, he's, I'll quote the rest of it. He said, uh, The crew tribes negotiated with the KBRA defended the KBRA, saying that there are no guarantees of water for farms in the agreement, only a cap on how much can be diverted. And then again, what's capped in this agreement is agricultural water use. He was saying that down along the coast, trying to appease people down there. And uh, so these are the people that are going to have the votes when the dams come out. They're going to demand uh, higher water quality and, and through that process go after the upper basin people. Also, I wanted to bring up for the uh, Iron Gate Dam, for these dams, there's the Jenny Creek Red Band, Red Band Trout, which is uh, genetically distinct to that area. The dams come out and will affect that fish. Once again, they're doing what science benefits, uh, they're, they're ignoring that part of, uh, of the whole uh, scenario. No, I'm, we're still on the mercury. I'm getting ready to go to six. Anything more on the mercury, Mr. Morris? Anything to finish up there? That so we brought that to Klamath County Commissioners as well. That's that's something that we're continuing to uh, put forward. Correct. Correct. Okay. All right. So we'll move on to number six. Everybody's good with that. Okay. Uh, Mr. Morris, did, is there something here you want to start us off with? Just to set this up, obviously one of the first things we looked at in Klamath County and Siskiyou County working together on, on these issues, it, uh, we wanted to identify the best we could our basic common objectives. And if you do that, what you have in your agenda packet is the last two pages. Uh, to summarize, uh, we have four um, key objectives that we are looking at as the common ground between the two counties and the, basically the foundation of from where we'd like to build our efforts to, to move forward. Uh, those four common objectives are, uh, number one, to establish adequate water storage and water supply reliability throughout the Klamath River watershed. Uh, number two, to reoperate the Klamath Irrigation Project and the Klamath Hydroelectric Project to maximize utility of available water supplies and reduce negative impacts on species of concern. Number three, Retain clean, renewable, hydroelectric generation and affordable power rates in both Klamath County and Siskiyou County. And number four, bring facts, truth, and accountability to bear to expose the unfounded claims, inflated promises, and hidden unknowns and uncertainties of the Klamath Hydroelectric Settlement Agreement and the Klamath Basin Restoration Agreement. And the last page of your packet has an expansion of those four points with some additional subtopics uh, that we put forward for consideration by both counties. And it's our common ground in how we would like to move forward in a joint initiative.
can't remember what section it is in there, but uh, it basically states any excess water would be deemed as environmental water, which would be not usable for off-stream storage for agriculture. So it becomes very, very problematic. You could store all the water in the world, but if this goes forward, uh, it's not usable. It's only usable for fish, not for, for agriculture uses. It's, it has to be a non-consumptive use. That's another another very problematic part of the, the of the solution that would be there. But if this goes forward the way it's written, then that solution is no longer a solution. Supervisor Armstrong. Yeah. Um, one of the issues I think that that's always been sort of a third rail, and I don't know why, is the Trinity River. Um, and for us, it should not be a third rail, and uh, where you have the the fish die-offs in the um, lower planet. Um, I put that uh, partially at the feet of the way the Trinity is managed. And we don't talk about the tons of water that are diverted from the Trinity and sent down to the Central Valley. Um, they just look to squeeze more water out of the other base and compensate for that. And I think it, we need to look at the whole planet watershed. And we also need to look at the diversions that are going to Oregon. Um, to the Applegate Valley and all. Those are, are water diversions that are going there. And they're also never mentioned, you know. So um, these are all things that the whole context of how this is, you know, it's just uh, uh, these are the only places we can squeeze and this is where we're going to squeeze. Um, so that's a problem to me uh, that we need to address. Um, and I think we have common ground in addressing that. There's also in my particular area, the Scott Valley, um, and in the Shasta Valley, there's in the um, appendices, I think it's C or something, there's this whole hidden um, agenda about acquiring land and water and uh, um, uh, putting farms dormant in Scott and Shasta. And, uh, you know, we never, uh, during the whole negotiation process that went on, there was never any mention of the Scott and Shasta being a portion of this. Nobody was ever invited from the Scott and Shasta to sit on the uh, negotiating committees. Yet, yet, when you look at the, the specialists, when they talked about how this would benefit Coho and Chinook salmon, they talked about the reason why it's going to overall benefit is these little hidden, hidden things that they're going to get more out of the Scottish Shasta. And um, we've seen as a follow-up on that, the attempts now to the lawsuits that are going forward, that uh, they started in the upper base, and now they're coming down to the Scottish Shasta to rest control um, over water sources and to take uh, water away from agriculture. And uh, um, so, you know, it's it's a big, big agreement. And uh, uh, there are uh, lots of things. It inundates lands in my um, district. I have a gentleman who um, invested his life savings to develop a, a resort eventually right below the dam. A uh, Marigate man, his, his property is going to be inundated. His dreams destroyed, his investments destroyed, um, and all the people that live on the lakes in um, this district, you know, how they're going to be affected. None of these are ever brought out. And uh, um, it's just, yeah, I'm, I'm very grateful that you were appreciative of all the, the, the reasons why the dam should not come out. And there are good scientific reasons why they should come out, and there are a lot of people reasons. Um, and I know we, when we have floods, um, my communities in Syed and uh, Happy Camp, the water, they're in narrow canyons, and the water goes over the river. And uh, I know that we used to get at least a day's warning about when they were going to release water from the upper basin so we could reposition things because those communities become isolated. We don't have any dams to control that. These people are just going to be flooded out, and they're not going to have any warning at all. They're not going to be, we have no flexibility in management. Um, there's no flexibility in management when we look at 
the juveniles, they discovered that they, uh, they like to live in the areas on the sides of the river and they manage the river. Not that management's going on. I have constituents that are in their 90s who said we used to walk across the land of the river. So, so you know, there are lots and lots of reasons why this is not a good idea. It is going to be a disaster. And Siskiyou County is very concerned because your dam removal entity, you know, everybody's walking away without any liability. And their dam removal entity, you know, is supposed to cover, you know, through a bond or something, you know, through another process. You know, but it's going to end up in our laps as a county. And as a county, you can understand that, what happens when you're the ones that are going to have to clean up the mess. You're the ones that when you, they take down the dam and they put the, uh, the detritus and the rebar and all of that. I don't know where they're going to put it. We don't have a landfill anymore. We have a transfer station, but you know, they're going to bury it somewhere out there. You know, we're the one, you know, the roads that are going to be, have this heavy equipment going up and down it. They're bad roads anyway. We don't have, you know, they're, they're along a rocky cliff. Um, I don't know who's going to maintain those. There's no money in there for that, you know. It's just a bad idea. It doesn't help people. It doesn't help the county. Um, it's just really, really a bad idea. Uh, Chairman Kuzef, uh, it's an interesting balance. Uh, Supervisor Armstrong brought up the Trinity River, uh, and that sounds somewhat silent on that issue. And uh, on the Oregon side, we do have our version of the Trinity River. That's alluded to a little bit as a four-mile diversion into the Rogue Valley and the Jenny Creek. Uh, uh, and, and I'm not disparaging the Rogue Valley. Uh, they have they need the water also. Uh, but in those closed door meetings, it was very obvious that that, that water was going to be that diversion was going to be stopped. Uh, and uh, and I know myself and others, including Senator Hicks, that have been in the Rogue Valley numerous times, warning the Rogue Valley irrigators that that was coming down the road eventually, that that water would be called and that would stop. And that, and they absolutely would not listen to us whatsoever until last year, Oregon Water Resources Department in a meeting in, in Metro, I believe it was, made a, a very startling dis, uh, announcement that the diversion at a four mile uh, reservoir needs to be modified so that that water will go east where it used to go originally, not into the Cascade Canal which goes into the Rogue Valley, which Rogue Valley gets a third of their irrigation water from the eastern uh, watershed. Uh, that woke up a lot of people. The unfortunate part of it is you can tell right away who has the bigger political clout in Salem and Washington, D.C., the Rogue Valley or the Klamath Basin. Within a number of weeks, they had a, a not a, they call it a stay or uh, it was delayed for this year. But I think that did wake up the Rogue Valley irrigators, at least to a point, that their water is at risk also. Like we've been telling them, like Senator Whitson said, for at least seven years we've been telling him that. And he's championed that uh, time and time and time again, talking to the irrigators over there and the commissioners, and uh, they just uh, said, don't oh, know, it'll never happen, that, uh, that our water is safe, it's stored water, it'll never happen. Well, they had a wake-up call uh, at least we are a little ahead than, than you are with the Trinity River. At least they, they did breach that subject, which I was very shocked at. I thought they would wait until after these things were all signed and then drop the bomb on the Rogue Valley. From this uh, tactical uh, perspective, that was, a, that was a terrible mistake for them, I would think. But I'm not going to give them advice on, on better tactics, but uh, uh, to drop a bomb like that in the Rogue Valley, which was very supportive, or not necessarily supportive, but just not opposing dam removal in the KBRA, uh, that was a terrible misstep, I would think. Uh, realizing that we've been telling them it's true, their water is at risk, 30-some thousand acres of water, and uh, and that will be devastating for the Rogue Valley. And uh, so it's, it's going to be... I hope the Trinity River is, issue is, uh, is addressed in those closed-door meetings, as you well know, they would not talk about that. 
I mean, that was taboo. If you brought up the uh, Trinity River, I think they would like to throw you out of the room. Mm -hmm. but, uh, uh, but that's just the way they operate. Supervisor so. Balance, right? Well, uh, just for uh, just my own education, because I did a little research on that. You know, that's part of the Central Valley Water Project that was, was radical. So you you better put yourself back against that. Oh, yes. Because that, that water is dedicated for agricultural uses and hydroelectric. So, you know, you, you take it here, you, you know, there's going to be a big opposition. And Central Valley irrigators are bigger and stronger than we are because, as you know, demographics dictate that we're just a small piece of that equation. Senator Whitson will tell you, he's got to balance not just here, everywhere. Mm -hmm. We have two senators in California that are probably Senator Feinstein. She's very well just waiting to send you out because she has a house. You know, and so I, you know, I, I want to caution me that all of us to, you know, don't demonize the other side. Oh, no, you know, they're no. looking after their interests. I mean, you know, we, you know, the, the unfortunate reality is we haven't been able to come up with something that we can all agree on, compromise on, or you know, to try. When we look at some of these things, you know, one of the things that comes to mind, what have we done? Supervisor Bennett brings up some of the projects that the RCDs have done. You know, I, you know, I, I personally have seen the, the, the shift, if, if you will, in uh, the fisheries are coming back. I think some of the things that we have no control of, the oceans, we talk about, you know, I think it's in the, you know, the word, the Pacific, the Yeah, we have no say over that. We have no control over that. And that's, these are things that are out of our, out of our realm, yet they're a factor. You know, we should know about it. We should you know, understand what's, what's happening. We're, we have the worst drought that we've had in, in decades, yet we have the biggest fish return. You have to talk about bad timing, right? I mean, I've long said if the fish came back, there's probably no reason for it. Yeah, well, but, you know, that hasn't played out either. So uh, just, as a, just as a cautionary note that you know, when we talk about Trinity River, we're talking agricultural. So you're picking ag against ag on that. Well, that's been that's been the entire intent of this whole movement is to get ag against ag, divide and conquer, and that's what they've been doing. And I think we have uh, maybe we've missed some opportunities here. We've tried and tried with the Rogue Valley to, to gain uh, to work together on these issues so that we can get solutions that will work that will protect their water and protect our water on this side. Offstream storage is one of them. Uh, there's, there's many venues that could be, uh, uh, as a collaborative effort of, of, of those irrigators farther down in California to work with Siskiyou County and Klamath County and Rogue Valley, Jackson County to work together and really have a voice to get upper basin or off-stream storage everywhere. I mean, you, we need more and more and more of that because that, that's where one of the biggest keys is to this whole problem is, is off-stream storage. Uh, we had a project here in the Klamath Basin, you know, the Long Lake for the study for years and years and years and years. Uh, and probably will never happen. It's too big of a, a project, and it actually would have solved some issues. And Siskiyou County supported it. Yeah. Yes, Siskiyou County supported it. We really appreciate it. And of course, he didn't go anywhere, but we're working on now more smaller projects like you guys are, higher elevation uh, up in the, uh, in the upper basin to get that really cold, cold water. Uh, and that seems to be maybe gaining some traction. But, uh, I think if we can keep the irrigation community together, keep everybody whole. Or if everybody has to take a little hit, then that's, that's survivable. But to let them continue this divide and conquer strategy is it's just uh, it's, it's very disheartening uh, to pit irrigator against irrigator and, and neighbor against neighbor and that type of thing. But, but that's been a proven methodology forever. Divide and conquer. That's just, uh, and they're very good at it. Unfortunately, they're especially good at it because they've had lots of experience. And they've got their federal dollars behind it. And, uh, and, and the lobbyists, and the specific lobbyists also. So uh, when we work on things, I would like to really try to work with the Trinity uh, recipients, you might call them that, and to have them as an ally, as long as, just like we try to work with the Rogue Valley irrigators. We want them as allies. We don't want your ear against your ear. That would be the death of us for sure. However, you know, we're treating, they're being treated right now as if that's surplus water. And if we can't meet our needs in our own watershed, then it's not surplus water. And they've got to have some concessions as well. 
Well, and I think one of the things that we'll be dealing with tomorrow, uh, there's a, a group of counties in the Central Valley that uh, are poised to uh, voice their concerns with regard to the California water bond that we'll be voting on in November. And these guys are, you know, they, they come from uh, the ag industry and they're representing that. And what they're saying is that the water bonds and all of the ones in the past, they haven't received a, a single drop of additional water. There's just been additional cost and no water. And I talked to the initiator of the letter and um, I said, you know, for us at Siskiyou, because there's $250 million in the water bond uh, for the California side on the agreements, on the Klamath, to take the dams out, I said it's going to be a difficult spot for us to be supportive of what you guys want to do. And, they, and he told me, he says, look, we, we would agree with you. We don't think that that $250 million should be taking dams out. They're a proponent for more water storage altogether. So there's an alliance building there, even though um, you, you could say that they're kind of on their own and we're on our own, but now all of a sudden we see that we have something in common that's going to cost all taxpayers. Um, and if, if there's something in there that can actually get more water storage and eliminate the, the, the 250 for dam removal, um, that's a possible bridge that uh, you know I'm, I'm willing to take a look at. Um, what I guess is very frustrating for me is the, you know, the agreements talk about um, the cost of, of dam removal and you know Senator uh, Wyden has come up with he's trying to get this 550 million uh, mark for the cost uh, but we all know that it will be upwards of, of, of a billion or more or two billion before they're done but the cost of Long Lake for instance just additional water storage would be a fraction of that cost and there's the there's this uh, lack of a willingness to find a solution to actually be implemented that would fix the problem it's this yeah yeah and 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 cuz when we brought that up in DC and, and we're supportive of that well who comes up with a study but BOR that says oh uh, guess what now it's not feasible after spending 4 million bucks to find that out so Water storage is key, and, and the regulatory agencies tell us, uh, I'm sure they tell you as well, that more water equals more fish. Well, that's not true, but if, it, if you want to even use that, then why aren't they uh, supporting more water storage, off-stream storage, something that provides more water in drought years for fish? But they don't want to talk about that. Uh, one other thing I'll bring up is the Wales report, it's W-A-L-E-S. It was done by the Department of Fish and Game back in the 50s. Um, a gentleman there by the name of Wales uh, documented uh, fish returns for the Chinook clear back to, I think, 1924. And in low water years, uh, there was a higher number of amount of fish in drought years than in high water years, which, again, is, is fascinating to this whole dialogue when you talk about <coughs> more water equals more fish. Trap and haul is one of the things that uh, it, we've been very supportive of. It's the only thing, at least in, in I think, my mind and I think our mind, that uh, keeps the rates down for uh, ratepayers and taxpayers. Uh, Trap and Hall is used on the Lewis River. There's 400 megawatts of power for, on four dams for Portland. And uh, Trap and Hall is used on those. Trap and Hall to where? Uh, well, around the dams. Around the dams to where? Above. <coughs> You don't want salmon in the climate. In the climate. <laughs> well, and but what my my point is, where I'm going with this, is that at Kino, that's where they're going to begin trap and haul. They're going to take out four dams and then start trap and haul. Um, and I don't disagree with where you're going with that. But I'm saying if you're going to take out four dams for trap and haul now, why wouldn't you at least begin to do it before you take them out at a cost of a billion dollars? That doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Yeah. Not that I would want to see them up there at all, yeah. but um, exactly. Uh, you you could take out the you could take out the dams and, and then trap and haul, like you say, above the other two dams. But what's the point? Mm -hmm. it, 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 there was never there was never salmon in Klamath Lake anyway, and and if there was, there would be remnants of them still there. There's not. Uh, there's a big uh, lake trout, but uh, there's no evidence. As a matter of fact, there is evidence contrary to the fact that there was ever 
ever a, a fish above certain reefs. Now, there were some fossilized bones they found. Yeah, one fossilized fish, one fish. <laughs> one fish bone. Well, I, I just don't believe there was ever any up there. So the trap and haul, I, I think, is a view. Uh, it should be a view point. I see your point, but but I hate to, to even... Uh, uh, you don't want them up there at all? I don't want them. I, well, they've never been there. Right. Um, you can raise them uh, up in... Uh, the uh, Wood River Valley up in Fort Creek, there was a, a salmon hatchery up there. The salmon were very happy. That, that's good cold water. The salmon are not going to be very happy in Klamath Lake, believe me. And uh, uh, I just I just think it is uh, something that shouldn't happen if they if the dams were removed. You, sh you do not want to trap and put those salmon in Klamath Lake, but. Uh, and I don't think that you want to, with the dams in, I don't think you want to trap it all up above that, uh, you know, take them up to above those four dams. I, I, you know, that concept just doesn't make sense to me at all. If you do want to see them above the, above the uh, four dams, my, I said it right from the very beginning is that build some fish ladders if you're that concerned about whether or not you want to fish above those four dams. Well, yeah, but, you but, know. but the, we have been told that the cost of those fish ladders is $350 million. And again, that comes back to the ratepayers. And uh, if you're going to get yeah. the same results with trap and haul, I, I guess I'm trying to balance. It's in the agreements. They're going to do it if they take them out. I've talked um, to some contractors that said, you give me $350 million, I guarantee you, I'll take that contract. <laughs> I mean, they, they plan on making about 200 million bucks. <laughs> so, so, how would you feel though about the trap and haul? I mean, this this opens up a door. Um, it does. It because does. I, I I know that Klamath doesn't want to see them up there at all. But even with fish ladders, you're going to get the same result. But it's going to cost all of us in the room um, quite a bit of money to be able to do that versus trap and haul. I, I would like to see them. Try the trap and haul and see how many days they survive. Yeah. I'd be for that. Yeah, we've advocated for that. I think that's why they don't do the trap and haul. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, yeah. the answer is so obvious that it's you can't see the forest for the trees. I think that uh, Senator Whitsitt and I, a few years back, at one time, both de declared that we had pickup trucks that we could fill with water and try it ourselves. <laughs> I'm, I'm not trying to put you on the spot, but it, but that's how easy it is. Uh, it, just to see what happens, but uh, the agencies yeah. just don't want to go there. Yeah, they, they, they did have some uh, in nets or in traps in the lake, but they were there for a very short time and they started dying. And uh, we never really got the real full rest of the story off of that study because they took different age uh, salmon and put them in uh, actually right in the Wood River area there where the deepest, coldest water in the Klamath Lake was. And they started having problems and they pulled the traps out. And then, there and, and they, they terminated the study. So uh, I think we all know where that's going to go. And, and if I'm not mistaken, Supervisor Armstrong may be able to answer this too, and I'm going to you, is that it's my understanding that I think it's roughly 90% of the population of the salmon are below Iron Gate. We're dealing with basically 10% of what's trying to return. Um, I think that the idea was to open up uh, um, I was told years and years ago when I was on the Klamath River Fishery Task Force that they're hoping to bring back the spring chinook, which would uh, round out the um, subsistence uh, foods for the crew tribe. And that there was a large spring chinook run and apparently in the climate at one time and the, um, they were lost when the dam went through. But uh, they're looking at the spawning and we're in that gap above the dams is a good place to go, you know. Well, um, trap and haul is, is, a, um, is a way to do that. But we've got so much spawning and bearing habitat that's underutilized. And we, the road department has how many bridges that we put? You know, we've opened up hundreds of miles of uh, additional spawning and bearing habitat. And, and so, you know, this, this whole thing, I, I believe Dr. Menke has, has looked at the repercussions of taking out the dams and the nutrients and the temperature 
regimes for that area would just make the whole thing lethal for um, you know for dissolved oxygen and and uh, um, the algae mats and all during the, if you took out that if you took out the heat. so you know it's uh, um, there are there's a spring or something up in the upper you know above the, the dam Yeah, that has some cold water, might be good spawning. But I mean, it's just to, to rip off the dams for that. You know, it's there seems like you can open up some additional spawning habitat and side channels or whatever rather than do that. Right. I agree. That's worse than a 400-dollar hammer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, even I think Rock Creek below, right. below the dams is. Uh, I think there's 12 miles of. Uh, Habitat there that can't be uh, tapped at all because of the culvert, because of landslide there, and nobody's willing to go in and fix that so that they could have additional spawning habitat. So there's plenty down there. It, they just this the agenda moves this way. Yeah. Supervisor Chris, said, uh, Congressman McClintock was at a group advocating for dam removal back in 2009 or 10. He asked a really simple question: How much is, how much is this going to cost? Sorry, this is thing you do. I need to use the microphone. It's a little so, difficult. Sorry, there. <laughs> she didn't ask you, so I better use it. Um, so, at any rate, with the uh, um, to repeat myself a little bit here, Congressman McClintock was at a group that was advocating for dam removal. They were giving him all the figures and the numbers, and he asked a simple question: How much does this cost per fish? And they didn't have the numbers at that moment they were going to send them to them. And they haven't got around to it in the last five years. <laughs> um, you know, economically, it, it, it makes uh, no sense for that. To follow up with Supervisor Valenzuela said, I, I agree with him, um, you know, not taking on the, uh, the use for the Trinity. I think what we would argue, um, Congressman Lamalfa was asked, why do you spend so much time in Siskiyou County in such a small part of your population for your district? Why would you spend time up there? He said over his years in the Assembly and the State Senate, he realized that what happened first in Siskiyou County happened next in the rest of the state. And that was why he spent so much time in, in our part of, the, of, the, of his district. Um, and I think we should argue that to the uh, users of the use of Trinity River. When they, if the dams come out, you're not going to see a, an increase in the fish. You're going to see a decline. And they're going to have to go after somebody else. And it's going to be them. So I, I agree with not attacking, but using them as, as allies of your next. Um, Humboldt County also has access to a 50,000 acre feet from the uh, Trinity Dam uh, that can be used to supplement flows. Um, skip around here a little bit. Uh, Commissioner Mellums, in the uh, National Academy of Sciences report in 2004, for many of the commissioners here, uh, they talked about oxygenators in Klamath Lake, have they tried that for the sucker fish? Do you know if they've tried that? I, I, I know that they've talked about it, but okay. I don't think it's ever been, never happened. Mr. Winsett, or Senator, you, know, you don't know, okay. I don't, think, I don't think it's ever happened. Ever happened. That was the main, it, it tells you the agenda here, the oxygenators for uh, for uh, for the sucker fish in, in Klamath Lake. The uh, National Academy of Sciences in the 2004 report made clear it wasn't lake level. It stipulated um, how many suckers survived. They said you need to, it's the oxygen uh, that needs to be introduced there because it's a dying lake. Um, and so it's interesting that in all these years, the number one recommendation for saving the sucker fish was to use an oxygenator to give areas of relief for the sucker fish, and the government hasn't used it once. Um, it's something that we should advocate. Hey, here's some solutions. And the way I understand it, I don't think the dams have to come out an oxygenator in. I don't think that has to happen at all. I don't think so. Uh, so, I mean, these are common sense solutions. That are, you know, the National Academy of Sciences came up that were really uh, good. And then with regards to the dams, um, I don't just want to focus on them, but it has an effect in, in my district and in the Two Lake Basin as well. Um, the the, the uh, sucker fish is, is less in numbers than what it was historically. Um, the National Academy of Sciences in this 2004 report reported about how healthy the sucker fish were in the main stem Klamath River dams. And how a good idea would be to trap those sucker fish, not all of them, trap a percentage of them, introduce them to Klamath Lake, 
and reintroduce them to the spring areas where there's not um, spawning habitat. There's a spawning habitat, but because of the fisheries years years ago, they aren't used. Introduce those um, acclimated to the area, introduce them to those spawning habitat, and repopulate. And the sucker fish uh, in those dams can can serve that purpose um, down the road because you know, die-offs are natural. So you can go back down there, get those sucker fish, bring them back up to the Klamath Lake, um, and have them uh, introduced to those areas. They said those sucker fish don't spawn in, in the main stem dams, but they're very healthy and would be uh, very good spawners. Again, here's another proposal done 10 years ago to help the sucker fish, and, and instead they're going to tear out dams to kill that whole opportunity off, which is terrible. Um, in regards to the uh, sea shasta uh, disease um, below the dams, um, Supervisor Armstrong brought up, they used to be able to walk across it with their socks. Mr. Gazzali brought this up, walk across their socks and not get them wet years back. Um, what you need to do, and thank Mr. Mankey for Dr. Mankey for his feedback on this, is you introduce the natural river flows, and it's in our, our points here, you introduce that natural river flow, instead of shoving the water all the way down, let it dry out for a period of time. Every day, back them up. Let it dry out for a period of time and desolarize that sea shasta habitat, which is a main killer for uh, uh, for the salmon. And that's that's my montage of, uh, of notes there. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. As we dialogue about the uh, objectives, does the climate, are you in agreement um, with the objectives that we've stated here? Uh, for the most part, yes. I, I think. Uh, this, for the past hour, we've been describing, you know, a, a whole slew of items that belong under number four, bring the facts and truth to bear on this issue. And, um, you know, whether, it, whether it's cold water, whether it's uh, property rights, whether it's water storage um, volume versus water quality in cold water, whether it's flood control, all of these issues should be bullets in here that we describe, even the, the uh, Trinity water diversion, the four mile diversion, all of these issues bear economically on our counties and should be addressed. And they all, they're all facts to bear. And um, so I think what you have here, you've got A through F, and we've been talking, you know, just hammering all of these issues over and over for the past hour. All of, all of our conversations that everybody has shared in should be extra extra items with more detail uh, highlight the science and um, and it, it even include the the oddities like you were describing with the Shasta Commissioner Armstrong with the Shasta land acquisition you know Scott Valley land acquisition where, where does that fit in how does that impact uh, private property rights and those kinds of things those are all details that should be here. And I think we also need to keep in mind that the only method the federal government has for pursuing all of these non-solutions, well actually solutions we've identified that the federal government refuses to pursue is through deficit spending. So when you see trillions of dollars in deficit spending landing on the backs of our children and our grandchildren, that is the method that the federal government is using to crush our local economies. And we need to stop that and then let the, the local economy, our state economy and local economy, find an even keel on solid ground. As long as that deficit spending uh, machinery is in place, we'll never stop the EPA the Bureau of Rec, the Forest Service, NOAA, will never stop any of them unless we get, get our congressmen to recognize the tragedy of deficit spending. Professor Armstrong. Yeah, um, it, it, very, it was very clear when I served on the Klamath River Fisheries Task Force that there was this paradigm that they all embraced that you know everything had to be natural. And you couldn't have um, pitch hatch reach. You, you couldn't have uh, uh, solutions that they considered not natural. You know, it had to be uh, you know, storage, not natural. And, and by taking off all of these solutions, 
that are modern innovations and sensible to us as to, you know, here's, a, here's something that should be considered and, you know, they, oh, that's not natural, we're not going to, you know, who made those rules? That's not natural. I mean, we have to, uh, you know, all of a sudden we're going back to uh, Ludditeism and back to the uh, 19th century or something. You know, um, uh, let's look for some solutions and opportunities and not keep cutting off and making these little third rail, and, you know, the smaller, smaller box. Well, it's got to fit here, you know. Make it bigger. Make the pie bigger. Let's look at some innovation here. And, uh, uh, it's just uh, this little paradigm that um, somebody's bought into that we have to play by this, but it has to play by this rule, you know. And no, it's not. You know, there are real solutions. And uh, uh, Supervisor Casa has some solutions for IDA injection. And, you know, you can't go there. It's not natural. You know, it's a statement. Why? You know, it works someplace else. Why can't we do it? Supervisor Chris, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. One of the frustrating things is sorry, I'm sorry, I'm just making that uh, one of the frustrating things we're, we're dealing with here is that for Kitzhaber, Schwarzenegger, um, Kulangoski, uh, Jewel, um, uh, Secretary Salazar, for all of them, this is just one chapter in their memoirs. For the rest of us, the future generations, this is future volumes in our books uh, for us to deal with down the road. Um, and that's one of the most frustrating things. You have people from the outside, so-called so um, solutions, but when the locals don't want them, uh, something's being said. One thing I'd like to have added under uh, point one, under uh, established adequate water storage, um, would be to use, quote, use the already developed water storage options. And those being, of course, uh, the Klamath River dams where there's 20,000 acre feet that could have been freed up for um, for the uh, Klamath Basin. There's also a, a 50 or 60,000 water right, uh, senior water right for the Shasta Valley that you know, we can explore and look into. But uh, this not, you know, this does not say develop new additional water, but utilize the water we already have developed for the benefit of agriculture throughout the Klamath Basin. So, uh, Commissioner Belay, on the Trap and Hall, do uh, you agree to uh, maybe Trap and Hall above Copco and below J.C. Boyle? Would that suffice at all, or do you? I, how do you want to deal with that? I don't. I don't object to it. Uh, the the thing that I as an experiment, as right. an experiment, I I my I, I do not believe it's going to work. But uh, I, I it sure I sure wouldn't oppose. <laughs> Uh, you know, try it. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So I guess where I'm headed here is, here's, or do we have uh, agreement on both sides that we may be able to use this as a uniform document? And if there's something here that you need to take back and come back to us with, I, I think we, you know, we can do that as well. This is the first time you've probably seen it today. It, it is. Uh, and actually, we reviewed it a couple of weeks ago on the latest on me. Okay. Um, and then, um, and uh, it, it, and I think there are just there are just several several you know when it comes to bringing facts and exposing the truth and bringing accountability to the table, we we've, we've got a fair bit of material that we can push into here. Um, okay. This discussion being just the, this the first. Yeah, I, I haven't studied it myself in regards to. Um, you know, adopting it. Okay. Yes. Okay. Um, I, I'd have to study it a little bit more. Okay. But that's fair. That's no, that's fine. Uh, and I think we're going to the best. We're not going to rush you. I think we're on the right track. Okay. We're still right. on defamation ones. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to suggest putting some kind of time frame. Yes. No, that's where I was headed next. Uh, what do you think, time frame wise, if we could expect? Uh, get something back from you and then uh, bring these documents together, yours and ours, and uh, I, do you I, think we could get it done this month? That's what I was thinking. I was thinking you know, towards the end of the month we ought to be able to uh, discuss it and, and we could uh, put our individual thoughts together and then have another meeting on it and uh, get it back to you. Okay. Sorry. Right. That's reasonable. Okay. 
All right. So we don't need a joint meeting? Yeah. I, don't, I don't think so. I think we'll be all right with Mr. Morris. Are you comfortable with that? Okay. All right. Uh, you're looking for five minutes back there. All right. So we're going to take a five minute break and then we'll take up item seven and eight. Uh, uh, what are you going to do with the board? Well, I'm trying to be Supervisor Thompson, are we doing public testimony next? Not next. Mr. Bacon, we're going to do public testimony next, but uh, if you wanted to video feed that. We're going to go to item 7 first. We'll come into that. You want to catch all the talk? <laughs> Okay. Sissy so County Board Supervisors will reconvene. And uh, we were, the County County Board of Commissioners was in recess for about five minutes and we will reconvene. We uh, go to Supervisor Bennett to finish up on one item uh, before we go to seven. In, I just want to mention that in gathering our documents, our and bring the mic closer okay. to you because I, they're not hearing us real well out there. Okay. Sorry. Um, in gathering our documents, we um, want to make sure that the information that we get is accurate and um, not not doesn't have any flaws in it. And the early information that we got in the studies that were done in the 90s seemed to be less biased than those that were done in the 2000s. So I think, and some of the information has, has changed, but the value of the documents and the studies and the work that was done in the 90s seems to have more value than those that we're done later. And I like the CDM report, those those kind of documents. Um, so um, in gathering of our information, we want to make sure that we have the most accurate information. Okay. Thank you. All right, we're going to move on to item seven, a discussion regarding other issues of joint concerns to climate in city counties and possible uh, agenda items for future meetings. I'll start with the uh, Chairman uh, Belay. I had uh, one issue that might, that uh, Siskiyou County might be dealing with and dealing with in the future. And this has to do with uh, uh, flood, in, flood insurance that's going to be mandated by the Federal Emergency Management Agency. And uh, I think that this is a concern in uh, Siskiyou County. Uh, there is possibilities of flooding down there. There's possibilities of areas of Klamath County that could be flooded. And uh, the, uh, it's an issue that is going to be detrimental to people that have to pay uh, FEMA for flood insurance. And I think it's uh, uh, something that's going to have probably come to uh, a head here this year. And I, I just... Uh, uh, wanted to maybe put that on an agenda at a future meeting in order to maybe to discuss that. My personal feeling that I've been studying a little, little bit and I think this is detrimental to an awful lot of individuals in Klamath County that's going to be spending an awful lot of money and I'm going to personally uh, uh, oppose the federal government uh, coming into Klamath County and uh, dictating to us what kind of uh, money that we have to spend on insurance. Um, there is, and these are talking about 100 year floods and, and there, is, there is some areas in Klamath County that this is possible, but it's going to be very, very detrimental to the people that live in the areas that uh, can be flooded. And I think that uh, the city of uh, Wairika is actually uh, considered uh, an area that um, that could be flooded. Uh, I built a couple of flood control dams over there and, and uh, so they are very concerned about uh, that and they could put the whole city of Wairika in a floodplain and, and actually 
uh, create a situation where you have to pay FEMA for flood insurance. So uh, <clears throat> I can see why they're doing it because it's another uh, way for the federal government to make money. You calculate that all out. I know there's one person on the Sprague River Valley that had their insurance went from about 500. It was determined that they were in a flood area and FEMA charged them they uh, wanted 2,500. Mm -hmm. And so it's five times what was reasonable. And um, so you multiply that out across the country how many uh, dollars they're talking about and it's another federal government grab for money. They see that that is a way to get it, and uh, I think that it's going to amount to hundreds of billions of dollars. Fe uh, FEMA, I believe, is a terrible organization in the way it's run. I think it's very, very uh, wasteful. They don't spend their money prudently. I think that uh, uh, there's better ways to do that. I figured in Klamath County and the small area that we could uh, uh, be impacted by this, we could form our own insurance company, and when somebody's house uh, flooded and ruined their carpet, we could just rebuild their house or rebuild their carpet or, or, or their cabinets or whatever, and save those people, the taxpaying citizens of Klamath County, a tremendous amount of money and uh, just buy a new carpet. Because I think this is really a, a boondoggle, and I, I, the more I study it, the more I do not like the U.S. Department of Homeland Security. <laughs> Where we uh, came up against the same problem a few years back is FEMA came in and um, uh, redid their maps and they put they, they went digital. And what it did in McLeod uh, was it shifted uh, a floodplain from one area to another and did just exactly what you're talking about. Uh, the option that they gave our residents were if you signed up, I think, within the first I don't know, 18 months or something like that, you could keep your cost down. But if you waited until after, it would go to that, you know, $1,500 or $2,500 mark. Uh, but it also had to do with if you wanted to sell your house, uh, because it was now in a floodplain and you didn't have flood insurance, that the uh, mortgage companies wouldn't finance. It was a real, and I don't know, Supervisor Chris, if you have anything, we haven't heard anything about it really since it went into play. Uh, I don't know if you're getting complaints on your side or not. Yeah, I, I get to get the complaints on that one. I know there's legislation uh, back in D.C., I don't know, Commissioner Billy, it's the Homeowners Protection Act, I believe. And so there's legislation. The, we're lucky that uh, the coastal senators are pretty powerful right now. So they're in Louisiana in that area. Um, they realize this, so they're, they're pushing legislation back in D.C. right now to uh, negate this. It was realized that FEMA um, used a study based from Iceland. And apparently the soil's different there. Then uh, the soil in Iceland isn't the same throughout the whole world. And they're, they're just realizing that <laughs> because of legislation. And so uh, it's the Homeowners Protection Act or Flood Insurance Protection Act. I, I, I'm sorry, I can't think of the name right now. When I announced it in McLeod at a Community Services District meeting, they just about kissed me, so uh, I almost had a bunch of husbands get pretty mad at me there. But uh, there is legislation being pushed, um, but I, I can't think of the exact name of it right now. But if we could get our own congressman to, to support that as well, which I think they are. I, I got the information from uh, Congressman Malfa's staff on that one. Okay, good, good. Sorry, I don't have the exact number for you. Yeah. So that may be something that we can joint, uh, have a joint effort on as well, and I'm looking at County Council, uh, maybe a letter between us that could uh, bring that Sure. Supervisor Armstrong. When we had our uh, regional Irwin meeting um, a couple of weeks ago, there was a speaker there on community aggregate power uh, from Marin County and talked about um, how uh, this community aggregate purchased power on the open market um, and then sold it bundle to local customers. And uh, um, Siskiyou County owns its own dam down in uh, uh, Box Canyon. And uh, eventually, we currently have a, a power contract with Pacific Core, and we sell our, our power to them, but that will um, lapse soon. Um, and also, uh, I think Roseburg has a biomass plant. I think you 
have some geothermal and whatever. But you know, we're talking about affordable power rates. Um, I don't know if a by state has ever been done, um, but I used to belong to the Southern Oregon Clean Energy Alliance. And uh, um, there may be something that we can, for our people, because they're so heavily, um, our agricultural people are so heavily dependent upon pumping sources for uh, water, um, that we can work together, uh, QAPA, I think, is, but they're looking at, uh, um, at going to the Bonneville Dam, but this community aggregate, uh, uh, apparently the, um, the actual lines and distribution lines and all of that, the billing, all that stuff <coughs> done by the power company, but uh, um, you have the, the aggregate, um, you have the control over the prices on the power by how you purchase it. So um, the gentleman said he would be interested, he would be willing to come up and talk to us about uh, um, how it's done in California. But uh, um, you know there might be some some room there where we could investigate uh, doing some kind of aggregate power community aggregate power to get better rates for everybody. Are you? Uh, that's something that's uh, that's something that's agreeable on your side. I think we talked about even that at the last meeting uh, that we had with regard to a joint uh, powers authority or something with regard to uh, uh, energy. Yeah, so, uh, 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 Commissioner Mallins. Yeah. Klamath County still has an energy advisory committee that's, uh, we haven't met for a while. I'm on that, that committee and it's a citizen committee looking into a possible uh, formation of a people's utility district. and. Uh, and the topic has come up about, uh, there's a couple members on there that really would like to investigate the possibilities of, of a bi-state uh, utility district of some sort of <coughs> feasible. Uh, we'd really like to, to have some conversations about that. Okay, we'd be interested in that as well. Yeah. One of the things that we've been advocating for is with Bonneville coming in, in the agreements, if you're going, if they're going to come in and provide uh, cheaper power to one region, they should be doing it to the entire region, uh, if, if, if in fact that's what they're trying to propose. How are you on that? Are you uh, open to that as well? Oh yeah, I think it, it's up to the BPA, uh, and they do go across state line to a certain right. distance. Right. So uh, that's something we just need to investigate okay. further. Okay. All right, what else? Uh, any other uh, issues of joint concern that you may have? Climate side. Use of the, the woods and forest service, uh, okay. timber sales, uh, or lack of. Okay. Traffic management. Travel, what about road? Yeah. yeah traffic travel management. management. Uh, that's, uh, we had a very interesting meeting here just a, about a week or two weeks ago. A second meeting, uh, uh, one earlier on. Uh, the forest service actually actually admitted this. I was, I was really shocked. I was really shocked. Uh, they said, well, if you leave these roads alone, you block them off, and they will degrade, go back to nature. And so I asked the question, have you studied if they degrade faster with use on the roads, or if they are blocked off and no use on the road? They said actually they degrade about the same, if you use them. So why close them off? They really didn't have an answer. They just really didn't have an answer for that. So. They openly admitted that uh, whether you block a root off or you use it until it falls apart, they, they degrade at the same rate whether you use them or not. <coughs> so uh, talk about a hypocritical method of keeping people out of the woods for no proven reason. In fact, they proved that it doesn't matter. They degrade at the same rate. We've been told that it's for environmental reasons. Uh, but we've advocated for, well, if it's for environmental reasons, why wouldn't you use the existing road system? Because what they're actually doing is forcing people off on different roads or making their own roads, which is what they're trying to prevent. It doesn't make any sense. So one of those, yet another. <laughs> How about our uh, Supervisor Armstrong? Yeah, to follow up on that, in the Forest Service, um, the Siskiyou County belongs to the Sustainable Forest Action Coalition, um, which is, uh, uh, 20 some counties, forest counties in California, but it also includes now Oregon counties. And 
Yeah, you're aware of And you know that they're going to be, there's going to be a meeting in Reading on the 27th. So there's been, we'll look forward to seeing you there. And that gives us an opportunity. There'll be two, um, two meetings this summer in Reading. One will be um, for, uh, with our uh, political people, our, con our congressional representatives, and one will be with our uh, regional foresters. And so we can um, work on uh, that agenda through that. And um, it also has, a, uh, I think we have some Nevada, we have uh, Wyoming, a couple of uh, straight, you know, Washington State and counties, but we're trying to form a larger coalition. Supervisor Bennett, and wait well, one more. I failed to. I'm sorry, uh, Aaron. In the back, uh, Aaron Ryan. Uh, is, uh, we have a representative from uh, Congressman uh, Lamoff's office here, and I neglected to acknowledge her. Supervisor Bennett, um, are you interested? When you said timber sales, are you interested in um, cleanup opportunities for for um, the timber industry and cleaning up your forest of the fuels in the forest as well as the timber cell portions? Absolutely, yes. Okay, there's some new technology that we've just become aware of that um, we've been working on and working with the Forest Service on um, that we might be able to um, talk about more in future meetings. And it's, and it's pretty exciting and um, it would be really Good for us to do it together, and there's, there's, um, it's, it's really, really special in, in how it works and how it, how it will help clean up our forests. Is that through state forests or national forests? National forests. National, national forests. Yes. So it's, it's pretty exciting. Commissioner, uh, I think. Uh, I would like to uh, ask if if your board would like to participate in the American Lands Council transfer of public lands to state and private county interests. We've, we as a board have joined the American Lands Council. Uh, seven of the 13 western states have uh, passed legislation within their own state legislatures to um, try to achieve uh, a surrender or transfer or disposition of the federal lands and turn those into state properties, county properties, and private interests. Um, Utah has made the most effort in that um, arena, and I'll just give you a couple of details. In the first year they passed the resolution, the second year they created another office for um, land management and wilderness. If they actually were to get those federal properties, they would want to decide whether that should be preserved, whether that should be part of a harvestable area, should that be, is it old growth, et cetera. And so they created an office to review that so that they could manage the lands when the day comes and those lands do, do, do get disposed of. The other item that I thought they did, which I think is a uh, is, is pretty neat deal, they required the uh, state legislature passed a, um, an amendment that required all state legislatures to uh, take continuing education for the U.S. Constitution federalism and states' rights. And I thought that was pretty sweet. Before you get that stamp on your forehead that says you're a valid representative for a state senator, you've got to get schooled in states' rights and um, the idea of federalism. So these are ideas that our county's involved in, in as we're talking about um, forest issues. I, I'm curious if you're uh, thinking about pursuing those on your own initiative or not. Supervisor Armstrong. Yeah, um, I did speak with uh, um, Ken Ivory um, oh, about a year ago, gave him my research. My, I had about 10 years of constitutional research. I gave it to him, and it, he used that um, in addition to what he had. Um, uh, in California, I don't know if it's yeah. going to be that. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be that. 
you know, great a difference or worse or better. You, know? <laughs> you can cut to <laughs> it. Is well, it's either the state of Jefferson or it's just, you know, take the land back. Yeah. It, sh it should be. It, by rights, it should be, uh, in my opinion, um, after a lot of research, it should be held the same. It's being held now the same as any other proprietor and should be subject to all the laws, local laws as any private party. And uh, it should have gone back to the states when they were created and, yeah. and not held. Yeah. I, I, th I think it's worth pursuing. People always uh, bring that issue up, gee, is the state of Oregon going to be any better? And the only way Oregon and California will be held accountable or be more responsible is if you can cut the cord to the uh, funding stream that's coming from the deficit spending model. If this state, in our state, since I realize we're in the we're across the border here, mm -hmm. if our state had to abide by these financial rules where it's got to be economically sound or you don't engage in that activity, we would engage in economically sound activities. As long as there's this stream of federal money and grant money and forest service management and on and on, we can continue to engage in policies that are destructive and the federal government will paper over that destructive policy with pretend money. It's coming out of a printing press and they will continue to mask the economic reality that's right under the surface. So I think this is an important issue to think about how do you get it back to the state and then you can hold the state accountable. If you never get it back to the state, you'll never hold the feds accountable. I think you're right. Well, and I think the uh, closest thing that we have to what you're referring to is that we've proposed legislation where uh, the county would manage forest service lands. Uh, we thought we'd take a 100,000 acre bite out of what they have uh, and manage it and derive the profit from that to try to show uh, a couple of things. One, the economic benefit to, uh, to uh, to the region, uh, the sale of that that could offset rural schools funding, and then uh, lastly, uh, get help the Forest Service get where they can't go. Uh, the proposal uh, eliminates NEPA, but we follow the California Forestry Act and CEQA because uh, we manage uh, a couple of thousand acres around Lake Siskiyou uh, in t that has timber as well, and that model's been successful even on a small scale, and we're trying to push that, but it would fit in any county, anywhere, uh, but with the caveat of the CEQA and for, uh, California Forestry Act, which it's a little stronger than NEPA, so environmentally it's sound, but uh, so we're working on something that's a lot of like what you are trying to do here in Oregon and I know in Washington and Idaho and, in, and Utah. Okay, Supervisor Chris, and then we're going to try to, yeah, we're going to comments, but uh, we're going to go to public comment here as soon as we can wrap up on um, other joint issues. Uh, just real quick on joint, sorry, sorry, that's right. Some people have uh, hearing like old, like farmers that uh, were always on, on equipment. A um, couple real quick ones um, that continue the public safety uh, and emergency services relationship we have with Klamath County. It's very key to the Butte Valley Two Lake Basins to have that uh, relationship there and the mutual uh, responses that we give. Uh, it seems to be working out well right now, but just to continue that is vital. Um, a lot of Butte Valley Two Lake people shop in Klamath, so there is some economic impact there. And uh, uh, lastly, and I, we don't need to get into it in depth, but uh, down the road with the wolves uh, being introduced, the effect that it'll have on agriculture, on um, public safety, on um, uh, diseases, uh, tourism, etc., cetera, uh, should be something that we should be able to uh, agree upon and work for. Okay. Anything else from any of our board members? Eric, anything on this side? All right, then we're going to, and County Council, do you have a list of some of these things that we, I have it too, if you don't, that, that we can bring back in future meetings. So at this point, we're going to go to public comment. Uh, you will be allowed three minutes to address both boards. The light for, um, is over here to your uh, left, uh, but there will be a beat. Is it right at the end or just before? At the end. 
So to listen for that beat, and I appreciate it if you could stay within that uh, three minute time frame. And the first speaker that I have uh, is Steve Rapalier. Is that right? You better, I may have mispronounced it. But no, you didn't. You're exactly right. Thank you. And then after him uh, would be uh, uh, Rex Casalio. comments. One, we were talking common sense on the water issues on the Klamath Lake. They've been killing suckers with the high water levels for years and it would seem to me when we're talking about oxygenating the water that if we were to bring the lake levels down through irrigation so that we're somewhere near the old historic lake levels in the fall, that it would be a larger percentage of, of cold water that's uh, more oxygenated coming into the lake and they may have a much better chance of sucker survival. Right now, the way they're doing it, they're superheating a lot of the water, causing uh, algae blooms, which help suck more of the oxygen out of the water, and it's been a total failure. So I can't see why they want to continue with the failure. <clears throat> On salmon and upper Klamath Lake, if they took a look at the history from the old journals like Gibbs or uh, Peter Skeen Ogden or Fremont or about any of the old explorers, they'd find it, or Stevens, the Modoc said salmon never got above lower climate lake. We had Franny down in Frame Ranch said the salmon were pretty much inedible by the time they got to his place. Uh, George Gibbs said they were sick looking and uh, would be inedible by the time they were 30 miles above the confluence of the Trinity. That's when they did their expedition in, in 1851 when they were on the treaty expedition. And these guys had no axe to grind. They didn't care about agriculture or anything. They're, they're, you know, some were explorers and some were all well, the Gibbs, they were on the treaty expedition. And Stevens was, a, I believe, an anthropologist. This is how you have to be visiting the Modoc and, and studying the Modoc. So they're ignoring the history. And then the fact is, if we looked at something like uh, Snyder's fish report number 34 that was completed in 1930 and started in 1919, he said there were no accurate records before 1913. But they quit fishing for Spring Run Chinook in the lower river well before the dams were built because there were so few of them it wasn't worth the effort, so they, they weren't even bothering it. And if you look at the nature of the spring run fish, they go up the rivers, they wait until the fall to spawn. Well, where would those fish have stayed in the Klamath River where the water would have been cold enough and deep enough for them to survive until the fall for them to spawn? And most of the spring run fish, I would think, went up the Trinity River. And even with that, it was a very, very small run. They, the only coho we know about apparently were maybe introduced in 1895 with plantings from the Sacramento system. So it's, it's kind of doubtful whether coho ever really were, were in the Klamath system much at all. But if we look at what uh, the biggest fish runs were from Snyder stuff, from, from the only accurate records they had, they're probably the largest run was around 160,000 fish. And we had, what, 312,000 fish last year? I mean, almost double what the largest known runs were before. And as far as uh, the evidence of Chinook above Upper Klamath Lake, when the zooarchaeologists did their report, they found 15,000 bones and identified 6,000 of those bones as some kind of salmonoid. They only found nine they were able to identify as Chinook. And they said they identified them as being, uh, they, well, they thought they swam up there because the ear bones were in the, in the fish. But if they'd read the old journals to see how the Indians prepared the fish for transport, they'd have found they'd either ground them up or transported the whole fish so those ear bones could have walked there with the rest of the fish. Thank you. Thank you. Rex Casalia. Bob King will follow him. Thank you so much for being here. It's, uh, Wonderful to see you all. Appreciate it. We've, we've been watching uh, all year, even under current water conditions, extremely excessive Klamath water flows through our property that has statistically been proven over the last decade to be of zero benefit to sucker and salmon fisheries. But that wasted water has cost the lives of many upper basin brothers. 
known practical options to obtain uh, special interest objectives at a fraction of the cost have been ignored in favor of a largely non-vested, publicly funded, profiting agenda. Generations loving and living with the river before and after dams know the downstream environmental and regional devastation that will occur with dams removals. However, the very fact that this proven corrupt process and failed science is still resulting in continued profiting pursuit of special interest agenda clearly defines a threat as great as dams removals. Implementation of this largely non-vested top-down hierarchy so removed from consequence for failed decision will guarantee our regional dev devastation even if dams removals uh, were eventually stripped from the legislation. It is vital for survival of both our environment and vested regional residents that this self-created hierarchy imposing unrepresented agenda and authority over everyone be defeated regardless of dams removals. One other observation, I absolutely agree that water storage is the only solution providing for all needs. However, disturbingly, all the proposed California bonds that I've read to date do not provide for the benefit of the people. But the requirement that any storage project requires at least 50% matching funds and the additional requirement that over 50% of all stored water be used for environmental purpose, that means none of the taxpayer-funded bond money will result in human relief. It appears as they stand, these bonds are not for the people. They are a deceptive, uh, opportunistic, indirect tax to pay for the agenda. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Bob King. Hello. I'm Bob King. I'm a farmer. And I appreciate that all the commissioners and the CSQ County have been been with us ever since we started this fight. I would like you to know I had uh, had three days with a bunch of environmentalists. Evidently they didn't know I was a farmer. But uh, there was a young one young man there and bragged all three days about how the clients hired him to take our water away from us farmers with a sucker fish. He said he didn't even know what a sucker fish looked like. And yet we had them. Some places we had sucker fish at the time, so I think you could walk across them, get across the creek. Anyway, that's just the start of it. And then somebody, some smart guy that was, had a, must have been paid by the government or something. He uh, said we needed water users to protect us. So they appointed somebody to go to the Great Solomon, our county water master, and uh, Dan Kempman, and uh, Steve Connery, who wants to sell property back to the Indians out of our tax money. He wants to collect the money for that. And the other guy is another guy on the board right now. I tried to get him to vote him out last time, but it didn't happen. And our commissioners, I mean, a California commissioner, her, uh, I shouldn't say commissioner, congressmen and senators decided that uh, they would, uh, well, we were sort of partners because the Klamath River runs into California. And you'll know if you're in California, you'll know what happened to uh, San Joaquin River in the, in the valley. They, the big farmers, they got talked into taking the little farmers' water. So they started voting with these guys to give up to, to little farms. And they did the job and they got, they got the little farms' water. Well, guess what? Now they're taking the big farmers' water down there. Thanks for the help, huh? That's the way it goes. We got a fight that is completely out of hand. And the only way we can cure it is to get rid of the UN. 
for at least a year say. And that's almost impossible with the money they get from a from a movie star and everybody with a puppy dog. Of course our puppy dogs up here have to be tagged and vaccinated. Now the wolves they need to collect them back and vaccinate them all. But the environmental members need to pay for that for their license and the tag for them. Anyway, that's I get carried away. I'm sorry. All right. I started. I started working when I was a kid. I was six years old when I met my first cow. And from that, that was my fault because I insisted on being one of the big boys. So my dad gave me an old gentleman cow to grab. I started milking. Every year I got one cow. I had it until I was junior in high school, milking 18 cows by hand. It was during the Second World War. And I was milking them by hand and going to school. And he sold the cows when I was a junior. Thank God. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I, and I said I love cows, so I went into the started my own dairy. And uh, with a little help from my in laws, I got started, which is almost impossible. They can't do it anymore unless you got help. Because you can't even buy equipment to farm 10 acres with without, without help anymore. And, uh, but now they're trying to take my water for one reason. The price of water in California right now, you wouldn't believe this, but they're willing to pay this year up to $1,400 per acre foot for water. And we live here in Clement County, have three and a half acre feet per acre of water, three and a half acre feet of water. They're paying up to $1,400 just to save their trees in California. And why they're planting so many trees, I don't know. But they're doing it. And, and <laughs> anyway, it's, uh, it's a shame because with that $1,400, I'd sell my water rights and get on my property. But <laughs> anyway, all right. <laughs> They're after us. They're trying to break the farmer. And the only way to break them is to take their water. But they can't take it away from the people on the east or the east side of the country. Because they get rain. They don't have wells. They, they get rain. So they can't control that. Although they're trying to do here. And here and Siskiyou and Nevada, all over the place. And anyway. Uh, one other little thing I'd like to put a bugs here and the e search. Go ahead and finish up your that, that last thought there, that would be great. What was that? Go ahead and finish up. Your your time's out. So just um, finish up that last thought you were gonna give us about Nevada, California. Okay. Let's put it this way. When you guys are voting on these drug houses, go back and look up in the nineteen thirty-eight, thirty-nine, and forty, forty-one, the history of China and Japan, they were fighting each other. Little tiny China, the whipping, I mean Japan, the whipping the ass on big old China. Because China had their dope houses, their, their um, what do you call it, those houses they had? That put almost took China down and they let Japan know that they were so powerful they could take China down when they seen our ships in the Pearl Harbor, they decided they'd take on America too. They got our ship, they could win us, they thought. Anyway, that's where we're going to be if they let them set up houses for, to sell dope here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Frank Televico. First of all, I want to thank you for drafting and putting a letter together to Congressman McClintock and all the others, uh, particularly Doc Hastings, who's chairman of the Resource Committee in the House. Uh, they should have that. And all the others who have shown at least sympathetic ear to our, our problem, our mutual problem. 
Secondly, um, you talked a little bit about some of your objectives uh, uh, um, uh, posed to dam removal, proposals for developing alternatives. I have been working with other people. Many of you know that. We provided information on and off to you. Uh, to Cisco's side, I think I sent some to Tom and I got one bounce back from you. And, uh, electronically, they didn't think your name was spelled right or something. But anyhow, uh, those, they're out there. But what I would like to make a suggestion is that both boards uh, point some real stakeholders to help Brian put this last piece together to get to Washington, rather than calling people in and out or whatever. I would say make it a, a somewhat like an ad hoc committee solely for this purpose to do that. And in this very room today, you have people here who could really help out based upon one, their education, two, their knowledge of the river, three, their uh, uh, de dependence upon agriculture for their livelihood, and just get together, help Brian and Grace and Brandon, because that's a committee as I understood it when you met before, and be a part of that to provide input and get a document that could go to Washington with the with all of the real stakeholders involved, rather than the 26 make believers that I saw in the Wyden Committee, either all government employees or NGOs. None of them, very few of them, had very a real stake in what was going on up there. And lastly, you talked about the possibility of looking at forming a joint powers agreement across both state lines. Um, I think that's a great idea. I think Bonneville would be a great carrier for that. And if you're ever interested, I know a company that can produce a lot of electricity. <laughs> Thank you. Jerry Batch Blue Peaks. Good afternoon, uh, Commissioners and Board of Supervisors. It's enjoyable to be able to say it. In a public hearing like this, I closer to you. I say it's enjoyable to be able to sit in a public hearing like this and really agree on what everybody has said, and I really appreciate that. And I think we're all on the same page. Uh, Marsh's comment on the Trinity River. I wanted to bring one issue up: is that I was called into the Farm Bureau to Jack Rice as their attorney. And uh, this is after several telephone conversations. <coughs> so I spent over an hour in his office down there. He was trying to convince me that we're better off up here to fold it on the dam removal, give up the dam removal. And I spent like an hour trying to convince him why that's not a good idea. And I finally realized what it is. It's because of, like you say, the diversion into the Sacramento Valley. <coughs> and by the way, they're neutral on the, on the position of dam removal. The reason is that they're supporting the agricultural interest in Sacramento Valley and we're peanuts up here. So we're better off not raising any issues about that. So I think that's the reason. The other one I want the other thing I want to address is the sediment removal and, and I made a comment in here on the last write-up on the Siskiyou County Daily News about sediment removal and comments that were made basically directly to me and to the fact of dam rate, or the uh, flood protection that the dams provide. And so, <clears throat> anyway, on sediment removal, the 20,000 20, acre feet of sediments amount to three feet deep, 150 feet wide on the Klamath River for 190 miles all the way to the mouth of the Klamath. So it's a considerable amount. They're, they're planning on lowering the reservoirs one to two feet a day, which is impossible to transmit sediments out of the reservoir. And so basically, where the sediments are today is where they're going to stay. Every year, again, you're going to have more sediments, you know, washed down the river. And they did a study on, on uh, dredging the sediments out. That's the only environmental way to remove the sediments. But the only problem there, it cost about $750 million to remove it. They have a $450 million cap 
in the KPRA. So that's why they elected to breach the dams. And so the other thing is, there's the flood control in there. The flood control, I, I need to come to the board supervisor sent it in. Uh, uh, my comments, my analysis, which was 22% reduction in peak flow. Their comment was that had I used a three minute step instead of a, of a five or 15 minute or three hour step hydrograph, I would agree with them, which was 6%. Well, I had the same program, put the same data in the program, and in doing so, it amounted to a 25% reduction. Their 6% reduction in peak flow by the dams was by a hypothetical storm on a winter snow park in the upper basin. Something very hypothetical, and it's uh, not even compliant at all to engineering practices. And uh, the other thing I had was uh, the handout for alternatives. And, and I'll give you this, and I didn't bring it to the copies of it, but it's alternatives, and I think a lot of you have already gotten them, on dam removals. And, and this is the comment I made on the EIR in which they use alternative number 11 which is our tunnel bypass. The tunnel bypass amounts to $50 million, which is 5% of the cost of, 5% uh, uh, of the cost of dam removal, and one-sixth the cost of fish ladders. So if you're gonna experiment, my, my proposal is to experiment on this. Rennie Cleland looked at this. He's supportive of the tunnel bypass, but he said, Jerry, the habitat that that will pr provide is so, infinitesimal as far as the river that he's not even favoring that because it's it's basically a waste of money. So anyway, you I'll, I'll, with this? You I'll leave these okay. Okay. things. Okay. Thank you, Jerry. Richard Marshall. Wendy, do you have some more over there? I do one more. Perfect. Good afternoon, everyone. President of Siskiyou Water Users Association and also a rancher in the Fort Jones area, and I wanted to commend this group. It's, uh, the meeting took a while to come about from the first meeting you had, but I'm pleased to see it happening. I think some good things, as Mr. Bosch just mentioned, has been happening here and things have been said. I know there are very uh, positive things to come. Yesterday, I had an opportunity to attend a conference down in Los Angeles where I spoke about the issues here in our area and the climate dams, and we are not alone. Many, many counties throughout the state are having some of the same problems that we are, including some states. At this meeting, uh, we had speakers from Sespoa, as well as uh, we had the Attorney General from uh, New Mexico. We had some other people there talking about the issue of the juggernaut that's been mentioned here, you're all aware of it. The juggernaut composed of the federal uh, agencies, state agencies, environmental groups with your money, our money, everybody's money, and run by special interests, basically, funded to some degree by special interests, who are interested in taking away water. And that's because controlling the water controls the land. So the theme of this uh, meeting had to do with how the water is used as a way to control land use and the fish, in, you know, whether it's our fish, the salmon, the coho salmon, or the pickled spike, or whatever they call it down there, the deltas, 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 thank you. Uh, it's all the same thing. What I would like to charge this group with, if possible, is that they should come up with a, a comprehensive plan for develop for taking the water that we do have already that falls in the mountains and utilizing it like some of our forefathers had planned to do. There were uh, at one time in the higher elevations we had uh, dams that would slow down the water and let it down more slowly. Couple that with a forest plan, forest forest management plan, which we've all discussed also at various stages here, and try to come up with an alternative plan to put back into the hands of our Congress people and senators that shows that we have a positive approach to how we think these things should be handled and not let ourselves be pushed around by uh, the people that are trying to do us under here. So that would be my suggestion. Comprehensive plan. Right, thank you. Donna Batchelipi. Boy, did you change your name, Jerry? <laughs> 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 she 
You're not getting a problem. You're not getting a problem. I just wanted to add one thing. I haven't read the letter that you're proposing to send, but I would suggest that one thing be added. The Siskiyou Water Users had a meeting with Pacific um, Power uh, about a month ago, and in that meeting, Pacific Power admitted that the only criteria for being a stakeholder on the KBRA was that you agreed to take the dams out. I think that might be something that our senators and assemblymen would be interested in knowing. And the other thing that came up was, um, what was my other point? <laughs> that, that, was, that was the biggest point that I wanted to make, that, that that was really something that they need to know. Oh, I know what my other point was. The other point was that the stakeholders that signed onto that KBRA, the uh, irrigators are all above the dam, which our people in Siskiyou County didn't even realize. That most of those stakeholders are above the dam, so when the dams come out, they won't be affected anyhow. The only ones that will be affected are we on the west side of the dam. And I don't think our congressmen know that either because our Siskiyou County residents didn't realize that. And I think that should be added to your document that you send to them too, because I think that's really important. That um, those stakeholders really aren't affected a bit. So anyway, that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you. Leo Bergeron. Uh, Leo Bergeron. Uh, I'm here. Uh, uh, kind of representing the Grange. I have a, quite a history with the Grange. Uh, past master of the California State Grange as long as and been affiliated with the Grange for over 50 years. So I uh, I, I have a, a tight grasp on on rural America and agriculture and, and the things that made this country what it is. And uh, I I can really appreciate all the information that you folks have put together and that you have and you've talked about today. Uh, the concern that I have is that <clears throat> it's talk. We spend a great deal of time analyzing and talking and, and scrutinizing these situations. And some of these situations we know are, are uh, a violation of law. They're a great travesty of, of, of civil rights. But we talk about it. Uh, my place is, is Stop talking, damn it, do something about it. Find a way to make this stop. I mean, regardless of what it is. Now, I know that's easy for me to say, I'm here, we can say that, you're on the other side, and that's a big deal, you can't do that. Well, you can do that. And the coho salmon was delisted because of action being taken by an organization. There was, um, there was 28 salmon on the west coast that was being considered for listing, and the coho salmon was listed as an endangered species. And there was a fight on, on uh, trying to establish habitat for a coho, and that was 300 feet above the high water mark, 300 feet. Uh, so the law says that a, a habitat for fish is water and substrates only. But that was, that was a battle that the Grange took on and, and fought it and won. But they realized that it was not the habitat that was the problem, it was the listing that was the problem. And through the efforts of the Grange, the listing of the coho salmon was rescinded as an illegal listing. Action, something was done. Now today, on the federal listing, the coho was listed as threatened. And that was because of the action of that particular action. It is not a threatened and endangered species nationally. The saving grace for the environmentalists and whatever is that California slipped in after that ruling was made or just as that ruling was being made and listed it as endangered in the state of California. So my position is, is do something. The KBRA is a violation of criminal law. It was put together in violation of criminal law. There was a criminal complaint sitting on the desk of the district attorney in Siskiyou County that has been investigated by the Sheriff's Department and found to be a viable criminal complaint. Sits there, get it done. 
make it work. Do something. Please. Please. Thank you. Curtis Knight. Commissioners and supervisors, thanks for the opportunity. My name is Curtis Knight. I'm the conservation director for California Trout. I'm based in Mount Shasta, and uh, we are signatories to the agreements. Um, I just wanted to uh, say a couple things. First is um, I agree with some of the things that have been said. Um, I don't necessarily agree with others. I don't know that uh, trading facts for facts or opinions for opinions or beliefs for beliefs is all that productive at this point. Um, but I wanted to talk about some of the things that brought up that I do agree with and I think do have opportunity. Um, I think the Trinity River discussion was interesting. It's certainly something we think a lot about. Um, I think all of you know in 2000, the allocations from Trinity River to the Central Valley were, were reduced so that uh, went from about 80% of the water being diverted to only 50%, and that's been a big uh, improvement in the uh, fishery and the health of the Trinity River, and, uh, and also, of course, benefiting the Lower Klamath. And I think all of you remember last year, uh, Wesson's Water District trying to um, get some more of that water last summer, and there was commercial fishermen and tribes, other groups, uh, supported the Rio Reclamation in providing uh, flows down the Trinity to help out the plant. And I think that was a big thing. So I think thinking about the Trinity is right. It's a big part of the plan, especially um, the help of the, the mouth of the plan. The IDA's idea in the Shasta Valley is something that we support. We're uh, in, in, in cooperation with the county. It's something we're trying to do. And it, uh, it is frustrating, I think, trying to cut through bureaucratic red tape to do and implement creative solutions, but we look forward to trying to do that. Hopefully next year we can take a run at that. I would urge all of you to look at a letter by Shasta and Scott, uh, some of the biggest landowners and biggest irrigation districts that came out a few months ago. It talks, uh, it refers to the climate agreements. Um, I just, I would just look at that. And uh, I see that. I see what's happening in the upper climate with this latest uh, Agreement, and from my perspective, I see an agricultural support. I see broadening of the tent, um, but I think uh, obviously you all see it a little bit different. But I think what's most important is we're going to have a, a pretty powerful U.S. senator who has said a couple weeks ago that he's going to introduce legislation to move this forward. And I would urge. Um, I'm a resident of Siskiyou <laughs> County, and especially our supervisors there. Think about. Uh, what if, and I'm not saying support it, I'm not saying you have to, but what if, and what are the opportunities that Siskiyou County can get out of it at least moving forward? Because it, it, it is on a track to do that, I think. Um, and also I just wanted to ask, is the draft letter available to see, or is it a draft letter? Is this online, or did we just see this today? No, that's a wordy graph. It's 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 a
you know, if you're interested in that, we can try to find that list because I think it's important for the reps to know that, you know, it's not like everyone supports it. Obviously, all of our um, elected officials do not. Um, also, in the letter, I think it was mentioned before, the Bi-State Alliance, we've been meeting for I don't know how many years, and they put together a great, hey, oh, <laughs> it's going away, a great packet of um, solutions, and you guys obviously have lots of solutions. Um, if it's not appropriate in this letter, you might at least want to mention that there's how many dozens of solutions to water distribution, management, um, suckers, um, like one thing where they planted the Caspian terns, which are fish predator in the climate um, refuges, because they were eating all the baby salmon, so they put them there to eat the suckers. Little things like that, I, I think it's important that they have the option of knowing how many solutions that we as you know, residents and our elected officials have. Um, one other thing I wanted to mention, as far as the Klamath project not being affected by the dams, um, I guess you all are familiar with who Craig Tucker is with the um, Crook tribe, and in a video I was listening to, and he's trying to convince the other environmentalists that um, this is a really good deal because FERC is not going to say that we're going to just take out the dams. And he said, let's just wait until the dams are out, and then I'll be the first in line to take out Kino Dam. Well, that's me. Like, we farm down there, and when that dam goes, a huge part of the Klamath Project will not have water, too. Okay, I'm done. But thank you guys so much. It gives us a lot of hope that you're representing your constituents. Thank you. Thank you. more? Aaron Ryan. Aaron Ryan. Just me. Just me. I thought I'd put in my two minutes since we weren't running over. I'm Aaron Ryan. I'm here with the congressman's office, and I usually get in trouble whenever I talk to you, so I figured, what the heck, I might as well get in trouble. Um, I think it's really great that you guys continue to meet in this bi-state fashion um, and look for a fix here. I. I we're looking at such a schizophrenic water storage issue. I'm, I actually live in Chasta County, as most of you know. And so down there, they're talking about raising Chasta Dam so they can have more, more water storage, which is going to wipe out you know, all these marinas and uh, mess up the town of Lakehead and the big bridge they're fixing now is going to have to be changed. And, You've got train trestles that are popping out of mountains that now have to do like a, a space mountain ride in order to meet the, the height of the water that they want. It's, tons of stuff will change. So on the one hand, we're, we're messing up a, a, a lot of community because we need more water and we want more water storage. And just up the road, we've got you guys. <laughs> we want to take out all these dams. It's nutty. It's absolutely nutty. And I, I was, I told Jennifer Menke, I said, I feel like we need to get the thing that people put on the uh, dishwasher, you know, where it says clean or dirty, so you know what's going on inside the, you know, it's almost like we need to have the I get it or I don't get it button for, for folks, because I don't understand how our water storage is solved by taking these out. It doesn't fix the fish, it costs too much money. Um, so natural the Natural Resources Committee that Doug sits on is really committed to helping. The difficulty is that anything, of course, as you're watching, anything that happens in the House, you know, uh, washes up on the shores of the Senate and, you know, rests for a while. So, you know, we'll see what happens in November, perhaps. There will be movement and change, and maybe we'll be able to help you find some, like, reasonable solutions, but... I do think it's great because this issue panics people. And even the folks in the upper basin, when they talk to Doug about this, they always say, you know, we know you can't support the dam removal, but we really need water and we really need the power. And, you know, somehow we need you to help us while you're helping them. And so can you support it without supporting it? And it's making people kind of crazy. And you represent all of them, so I'm sure, you know, they've called you before. 
They're not just calling us. And so we're sorry. <laughs> we can't fix it for you, but we're committed to at least helping where we can. So thanks for continuing to do this. I think it's really helpful. Thank that you. is all. And I think one thing, just to add to what you said, is that we've always been supportive of the upper basin and their water needs and that we've just, yeah. it's this whole nightmare that comes in between us that you know we have to figure out a way through. Well, and most of those people, whenever we speak with them, they say, you know, we really aren't committed to taking out the dams. We're stuck in this agreement, and that's a piece of the agreement. So I guess, in a way, with this um, water shortage that we're having now that's really messing up everyone's world, I don't know, maybe the timing isn't so bad after all. I guess we're going to have a little natural disaster. Maybe this highlights the need for water storage and makes this look like a dumber idea than it already is, if that's possible. So anyway, thank you. Congratulations, I get it. So uh, we're on item number nine. Is there anything that uh, we're uh, for, uh, that we're giving uh, action to provide direction to uh, staff on any items? Mr. Morris, do you have a, a clear indication of what items that we did indicate to you that will need further refinement? Well, just in, in general, we do have the list of items for possible future discussion outside of right. the dam issues. Uh, in, in terms of the dams, obviously the next issue of the greatest concern is the introduction of legislation by Senator Wyden. And so when that comes out, assuming it does, we'll be looking very closely at that to see if there are any surprises in it, or if it is really just a regeneration of Senator Murdley's previous legislation with the addition of the Upper Basin Agreement. And certainly, once we review that, we'll be providing feedback to the Board of Supervisors, and I'm sure Clayton County will be looking at it as well, uh, so that we can provide specific uh, direction to our representatives in Congress about any new concerns that, that may come about as a result of that bill. Okay, and for the audience, and I think that Supervisor Chris has been working with uh, Commissioner Mallins, that we are prepared um, to make that trip back to D.C. when that time comes. Uh, of course, we want to be uh, strategic when that happens. We just don't want to go back there to go back there. But uh, if this uh, <coughs> escalates to a place where we have to uh, lobby the, the floor again, that um, we're prepared to do that. So, uh, and you'll be bringing um, the letter uh, back to our board for final approval? Yes. Okay. Supervisor Chris, and I'm going to try and wrap this up so that we can get on the road because I know. Uh, in particular, our clerk's got to get back, hopefully by five. <laughs> nice. I'd like to get the uh, audio Okay. Supervisor Chris, sorry. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chairman. You know, I hear people say from time to time we need to jump on board and see what we can get out of it, out of the agreements. Um, Siskiyou County was part of the KBRA negotiations from 06 to 010, and we didn't get anything. So the best predictor of future behavior is past behavior. And there's no need being part of a, a group where two wolves in the land vote on what they're going to have for lunch. Um, what I'd like to also see, and I was holding on this quite a bit until we got to number nine, was I'd like to see another uh, joint letter to Secretary Jewell. Um, I was reading uh, um, the county website, and on November 4th, 2011, uh, John Bezdek, who's, as we all know, the special advisor to the Chief of Staff for the Secretary of Interior, said, quote, in short, we have met with the county every time you have asked for a meeting, and we will continue to do so throughout the entirety of the process. He said it two more times in that letter. I've been on the board for a year and five months. We sent the letter a couple months after I got on the board. They haven't met with us once. I don't know if Klamath County, because it was a joint letter, if you guys did something to them, but uh, they said that they were going to meet with us, and we need to ask them again. So I think a, a, a joint letter. Uh, restating our, our opinions for wanting to meet with them should be done. I think it would be uh, prudent to do it in the coordination format. Um, it's something that has gotten their attention in the past where they at least have to respond to. Um, but uh, he said he would meet with us. We asked a year and five months ago or a year and three months ago and they still haven't even came out here to meet with us. She did come out here for a, a snow tour of Crater Lake. I think uh, it would be prudent for her to meet with elected officials. Uh, in coordination in regards to that, uh, some people think that coordination um, is having sitting down having a cup of coffee and exchanging niceties. Uh, that's not coordination. Uh, some people think coordination is making fun of the person and their dog and all that stuff. That's, that's not it either. It's just a, 
uh, a conversation that we have along those four minutes, and I think we should re-invite Secretary Jewell to come out here. Can I respond to just a second on that? Commissioner uh, Mallins. Uh, tongue in cheek somewhat, uh, we did send that joint letter to Secretary Jewell to invite her out here, and she did actually get to as far as Crater Lake and the snow tour and, and the signing ceremony, and I think uh, maybe maybe she went to Crater Lake and that way she was giving us the cold shoulder. <laughs> uh, all right. I'm not seeing anybody edge forward that they have a lasting comment here, so I'm going to try and close this up. Uh, do you want to close your yeah, meeting we, first? We will adjourn this meeting at uh, 4.10. Of uh, uh, Climate County Board. Okay, and the... Siskiyou County Board of Supervisors will adjourn for 10 as well. Thank you all for coming.